All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and I want to thank everybody for being here for this epic, this monumental rematch between Mark Drysdale, evolutionist Mark Drysdale, and young earth creationist Dr. Kent Hovind. Tonight, we have the real Super Bowl. Worlds collide. If you have seen any of uh, Kent and Mark's previous encounters and debates, you know this will be one to remember. Gentlemen, Mark and Kent, thank you so much for giving us your time for tonight's important debate. Welcome. Thank you. All right. As we like to do here, um, kind of break the ice, get to know the debaters a little bit before we kick off with the opening statements. Uh, Mark, since uh, it's been a little while since you've been here, both of you, though, have been on the platform before in the past, and I am pleased to have you both here again tonight. So, Mark, why don't we start with you? How you been? What's going on? And a little bit about yourself. What's going on? Tons has gone on in the last year. I've had a pretty exciting last year, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, Mark Drysdale, I'm from Canada, up near um, Bancroft now. I used, I think last time I was uh, debating Kent, I was down in, uh, um, where was I? Wayne Fleet area and down on Lake Erie. And then, uh, so I've been up in, uh, up in, uh, Bancroft now for the last couple of years. And uh, no, I haven't been converted to to any form of Christianity or religion. And uh, yeah, just been just been getting myself through life. I do watch a little bit of what's been going on in Kent's life over the last couple of years, too, as well. I'm on a couple of websites that talk about him a lot. I know Robert Batty has a website on him. So I don't know, just been watching and uh, seeing if Kent's been learning anything about evolution. And that's me in a nutshell. All right. Well, I appreciate that introduction. That is what we are debating tonight. Is there reasonable scientific evidence for evolution? Dr. Dino, again, thank you for being here, brother. How you been? What's going on? A little bit about yourself. Hey, you're doing great. God's good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. Uh, we are building Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama, population 37. And we're trying to uh, get everybody converted, draw them into the kingdom of God before it's too late. We think uh, Bible prophesied the world's going to come to an end in a pretty violent way. It looks like it's getting started. We shall see. I, I cover that in my video series about uh, what on earth is about to happen. We've had visitors come from all over the place to visit Dinosaur Adventure Land. We don't really advertise. Just people just word of mouth. Got a bunch of them here tonight. You guys took the tour today. That's fun, isn't it? Yeah. You took the real tour. Yeah. Come on down. Mark, we'll give you the real tour of Dinosaur Adventure Land. Anyway, I believe the Bible's true. I think evolution is the dumbest religion in the history of the world. There's never been a dumber idea than to believe you are related to a mosquito. And I'm going to get Mark converted eventually. Have I been learning about evolution? Oh, Mark, I already know everything there is to know about it. It doesn't happen. I already got it. All right. All right. I appreciate the introduction, Dr. Hoven. I appreciate the introductions from the both of you. So anybody in the chat, uh, I see people are kind of flying in. So this is sure going to be a lively debate, I'm sure, between Kent and Mark, but also in the chat. So everybody in the chat, uh, just make sure that you guys are respectful to the debaters, attacking the arguments and not the debaters themselves. So I want to go over the format uh, briefly for everybody. We are going to be having 12-minute uh, opening statements. Uh, Mark will be uh, kicking us off with that. Then we're going to have eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals. And then we're going to have an open discussion. I want to make sure it's on topic. Uh, again, you know, we're, we're kind of just dealing with the points, dealing with the arguments and making sure it's as equally timed as possible. Then a five minute uh, concluding statement. And then, uh, guys, this is where we get you in the, in the audience involved. We're going to have an audience Q&A. So make sure you're tagging me with your questions. Uh, try and tag me at Standing for Truth. Uh, that way I won't miss them. All right, let's waste no more time. Let's get right into the fun and the party here. So we're going to hand it over to Mark Drysdale. Uh, you do have up to 12 minutes. Whatever you don't use, Mark, we'll just throw into uh, the audience Q&A. So go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, what we'll do is whatever time I don't take, we'll give to Kent. He's going to need it to um, to try to explain where this uh, evolution theory or religion, as he calls it, um, uh, falls short. So when it comes to evolution, and we've talked this basically to death, but we've learned actually quite a bit over the last couple of years with uh, the viruses that we're dealing with now. 
Um, these viruses actually become one of our strongest evidences for evolution. You've got uh, viruses that insert themselves into our uh, genome through DNA. We got retroviruses that insert themselves or endogenous retroviruses that uh, insert themselves um, with RNA. Um, and we see these in many, many sites going all the way back throughout the lineage of our descendants, going all the way back to the um, chimpanzee that we, uh, that we separated from and then continued to evolve from. Um, these retroviruses that um, have injected their RNA, which turns itself into DNA um, through a process, you can look it up, it's, it's a lot to talk about in 12 minutes, but at any rate, it inserts itself at a, at a, at a chance rate of one in approximately 50-ish million um, spots um, into the DNA chain, and we see this in cells, and there is absolutely no way for those viruses to be where they are if you couldn't trace our ancestry back through this lineage. We, we can see it and we can see it go forward. So we can see where there's been viruses that we've known the time that that virus was around and we watch it march forward through humanity from the time that it inserted itself in and then you passed it off to, onto your lineage. So there, there's really no debate left on this. This kind of became the last nail in the coffin for, for anti-evolutionists because there's no possible way to explain it except for the way that Matt Powell did in a, in a, in a bizarre call from Kent where he called up uh, Matt as one of his um, primary evidences against uh, endogenous retroviruses. And all Matt could say was, well, we'll just throw it back onto them and say that it proves um, special creation. Uh, God put these here and they're probably um, important for, for life forms to have these endogenous retroviruses inserted when, where and when, when they were, which we know is just not true. There's no evidence for that. It's just a ridiculous claim to make um, to just, it's, it's, it's like calling someone a name and just coming back with, I know you are, but what am I? There, there's no way to move on in science to take something that is thousands and thousands of peer reviewed pages and just say, OK, well, what we'll do is we'll just throw it back at them as well. No, that proves uh, special creation and we'll leave it at that. We won't add anything to it. We won't rebut any of the thousands of papers that these scientists and chemists have been doing for the last 20, 30 years figuring this stuff out. Now, um, I think it was 2001, the chimpanzee. Um, uh, DNA sequence was released for all the scientists to start looking over. And the similarities was just absolutely insane. There was, there's no debate left whatsoever in any of the scientific fields that, that this is not the way this all unfolded. And, you know, you've got all these viruses that can attack animals as well as people. How can we be specially created? What is special about us as a as a human as an organism that we are what is special that would make any of us think that we are made outside of the animal kingdom we are animals we react like animals our hair stands up on end like animals there's just so many things about us that are animal like that once something starts looking so much like something it probably is it and that's really where we're at when it comes to um or where we're at when it comes to uh, the, the viruses. And in my opinion, there's just, there's nothing left. And to think that there'd be a God that would, you know, we're, we're in this whole vaccine thing right now, all these vaccine deniers that are, are willing to bad talk vaccines. Are they willing to bad talk vaccines for rabies? Are they willing to back, bad talk vaccines for smallpox, for tetanus? Um, like, at what point do you do you stand up and say, oh, viruses, what a joke. I can take on any virus. Smallpox rot, rot your skin off, uh, right off your bones. It, it, and it loves children. Like, at what point do you say, uh, oh, vaccines are bad and, and science is bad, but I like this science. I'll, I'll get my vaccine for smallpox because that's a horrible way to die. Or we'll make sure that all the animals have their rabies vaccine because you have a zero chance of living if you get the rabies 
disease virus. So there's there's just so much picking and choosing when it comes to religion and science that it's it's actually becoming uh, pretty much a joke to me. Just watching the whole thing and seeing the picking and choosing that goes on, it, it's just so dishonest. And the science we accept and the science that they don't accept, I, I just cannot, you know, rectify the two in my head on on how you can do that. So I'll turn it over to Kent at that point. I don't want to talk into a big circle here where, you know, you can't remember what I'm saying and hopefully Kent will do the same. All right. I appreciate the opening statement there, uh, Mark. Let me just double check the time. Okay. I appreciate that. And we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino now. We've got uh, 12 minutes on the clock and then we'll move into some rebuttals and then a discussion. So Kent, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Mark, I'm sorry to hear you still believe in that crazy religion, but uh, we'll fix that tonight. I take the position that Bible is true. God made everything in six days. Dinosaurs lived with man. They called them dragons or some other names. They were probably huge before the flood when the world was destroyed by the Lord in a big flood. Noah took them on the ark, probably babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. God said in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. God clearly said he made it all in six days. Said it again in Exodus 31. Our video series covers a lot about that, as does our question answer, which we have all kinds of stuff on this on various topics that come up. And uh, Donnie, thank you for sending me the stuff on retroviruses. They are certainly not evidence for evolution. We'll get into that in just a minute. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Said it again in Mark 10, 6. Bible says clearly that one man brought sin into the world and death by sin. So in the creationist Christian worldview, Man brought death into the world. God made a perfect world. Man wrecked it. In the evolution worldview, death brought man into the world. Billions of things have to die. In Mark's religion, if one animal evolves a little better than the rest, the rest of them have to die or the new improved gene gets swamped back into the gene code. It's a religion of death and suffering and pain and agony. It's not the way God made, not my God not, didn't make the world that way. The Bible says Adam was the first man and Eve's the mother of all living. So it's pretty clear. Jesus said the beginning of the creation was when he made Adam and Eve. That's what he, Jesus said. And the Bible says nothing died till Adam sinned. And the Bible says we all came from Adam and Eve. It couldn't be more clear. And Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. Enos was 90. You can make a chart and add them all up. Many people have done that, as have I, and make a graph and show, hey, this is what the Bible says, how long they lived before the flood, up to 900 years after the flood dropped off. But if you add up all the dates, plus the known history from the time of Joseph, the last guy on the chart, we know that the Bible teaches the world was created about 4,000 B.C. or 6,000 years ago. I put a plus or minus a few years on there. So Jesus said the creation was the beginning. Bible dates add up to 6,000. The evolutionist position clearly is calling the Bible a lie. Mark would say he believes the Bible is lying or mistaken. And Jesus is a liar or didn't understand science because he lived 2,000 years ago. And Mark would probably agree that he believes death brought uh, man into the world. There was death before man even existed. Billions of things died. They trust the conventional dating of fossils by the layers and then the layers by the fossils. The geologic column they teach in the schools does not exist anywhere in the world except in the imagination. Where's all this new material coming from to make these new layers? They say the top layer is younger. I say, where did it come from? Outer space? There is no geologic column. There are no geologic ages. There is no fossil record. There's a bunch of fossils. Well, that's not a problem, but they're not a record. They don't talk. They don't have a date on it. There is no fossil record. No geologic column. It's fictitious. But that is the Bible for the evolutionist. You'll hear Mark talking tonight, I'm sure, about, well, during the Cretaceous or Jurassic or Cenozoic or stuff like that. It's his Bible. If you shake a jar with water, gravel, sand, clay, shake it up, It'll settle back into layers, gravel, sand, clay. Our whole gravel pit I live in here is gravel, sand, clay. Layers like that. You guys saw it today. How long did it take to form, reform the layers when we shook it up? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, it doesn't take millions of years. Gee, okay. Uh, Sandra, is that other uh, sand art thing in the bookstore? Let me have one. Well, could you get that? Okay. So you shake the jar up, and it forms all the layers quickly. How can the top layer be younger? Did it come from outer space? This geologic column was made up in the 1830s, and people swallowed it and should not have. It's dumb. It didn't happen, okay? It's a fact the Earth has layers. Now, that's not a question. Evolutionist says the layers form slowly over millions of years. From where? Moving it from here to here does not change the age of it. Creationist says the layers are all from the flood of Noah. 
But you evolutionists are always trying to erase that line between the fact column and your interpretation. The geologic column is the Bible for the atheist. It can only be found one place in the world, and that is in the textbooks. This textbook admitted it, got the textbooks. Right, where'd they end up, Judy? My textbooks? They're back there? Come, okay. We're moving our library around. He said, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. If it existed in one place, it'd be 100 miles thick. It does not exist anywhere except in the imagination. That's lie number seven I cover on videotape number four, lies in the textbook. This article in a detailed examination of the young earth creationist claim the geologic column does not exist. It is shown that the entire geologic column exists in North Dakota. Okay, they found one spot, or maybe two or three, where all of the layers are in the order that they predicted in their stupid geologic column. If you just keep shuffling cards long enough, you're likely to get them in this particular order. I bet if we shuffled cards long enough, we could get all the aces together. Yeah, doesn't prove anything. A little sand art toy to help you out here, Mark, right here. And we'll send you one if it'll help, okay? When you flip these things over, they will make multiple layers in a hurry. Oh, oh. get where it does, it does not take millions of years. Let's see. Let's do it right here on screen. I'm going to set it up. Okay, you ready? Set, flip. Oh, now watch. I'm going to set it down. I won't touch it again. It's going to make probably 30 or 40 layers in about two minutes. The geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah, put my screen back up there, brother. If you would. <clears throat> so all the layers, I believe, were formed by the, at the flood of the days of Noah. All these layers at Grand Canyon have nice, neat places where they join up. If those layers were sitting there for millions of years, shouldn't there be erosion marks between them? Why are they all stacked like pancakes? No soil built up between them either. The layers are different ages. Is the top layer coming from outer space? Shake the jar up. Okay, let's see. It's only been, what, about one minute. How many layers did we get so far? Hold it right over here. Other right side, okay. Yeah. Look at that. It's making layers already. The Bible says at the end of time, the scoffers would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. The layers form because of Noah's flood, not because of millions of years. The flood of Noah, the tide going up and down, if it was uninterrupted, the tide would become harmonic, and you'd get a 200-foot tidal change every six hours, 12 and a half minutes. That would shuffle this up and make multiple layers. We saw it happen in our little demonstration today in our gravel pit. Come on down. See, the moon pulls on the Earth's water and holds it like a magnet while we spin around. So the tide goes up and down, up and down, every six hours, 12 and a half minutes. At this latitude, 31 degrees north of the equator, where we are in Lenox, Alabama, we're turning nearly 900 miles an hour. You can do the trig on that. I can teach you how if you don't know. Okay, I taught trig for years. All right, let's see. Past all this. Okay. So we're going 886 miles an hour here in Lenox. At the North Pole, you go zero. At the equator, 1037.58, depending upon your altitude. Okay. And actually, depending upon the phase of the moon. Believe it or not, that may make a tidal bulge in the Earth. Who cares? Okay. So we're spending 886 miles an hour right here. And that's going to cause turbidity currents and all kinds of things happening in the shuffling of the sediments and forming all these layers in one year, containing bazillions of dead things. See, animals died today by the millions all over the world. None are going to turn to fossils, probably none. Yet we find fossils by the trillions. The layers of the earth are formed at the same time in Noah's flood and buried all the dead things. That's why it rounded off all the rocks. Our gravel pit is full of rounded rocks. They're in a big rock tumbler called Noah's Flood, washing them back and forth, back and forth with the tidal change. You guys saw that today. How many, how many rounded rocks do we have here in our gravel pit? Probably trillions or quadrillions, a whole bunch anyway. It's like it's been in a rock tumbler. It's a gravel right there. They call it river rock. It's not river rock. Ours forms in layers. Gravel, sand, clay. Gravel, sand, clay. Seven of them. We can show you the cliff. Mark, come on down. They are not different ages. So your geologic column does not exist. The Bible says in Psalm 62, they delight in lies. You have believed a lie. If evolution is true, what is the purpose of life? You're nothing but an animal. Where do I come from? Why are we here? Where are you going? What's the point of life? And I'd like to have atheists answer the question, how do you tell right from wrong? Is it wrong for the lion to go eat the baby zebra? The lion doesn't think it's wrong. The baby zebra probably don't like it. I bet the mama zebra don't like it. Where is the standard for right and wrong? You atheists have to keep borrowing Christian standards. So you ask about endogenous retroviruses. Let me just show you that there is a very clear answer. 
retroviral pr promoters in the human genome. Our analysis revealed the retrovi retroviral sequence in the human genome encode tens of thousands of active promoters. Transcribed ERV sequences correspond to 1.16% of the human genome sequence. Let's see, it, you can read all the article for yourself. Where's this one at? Uh, bioinformatics, okay? Endogenous retroviruses function as gene expression regulatory elements during mammal pre-implantation embryo development. Before the embryo gets implanted into the what's going to become the placenta and the, the uterus there, it, these retroviruses, endogenous retroviruses are, are helpful. Embryos exit the two cell stage, otherwise the ZGA will fail and embryonic development will be blocked. They serve a very vital function. They are not evidence for evolution at all. Scientists identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses in the immune response system. This has been known for a long time, Mark. Long regarded as junk DNA or genom genomic dark matter, Endogenous retroviruses have turned out to represent important components of the antiviral immune response. They not only regulate cellular immune activation, but may even direct, directly target invading viral pathogens. In this gem, we uh, summarize mechanisms by which retroviral fossils protect us from viral infections. So don't tell, quit, stop telling people they're evidence for evolution. They're evidence of an amazing designer who created everything in six days even thought about what's going to happen before the embryo gets implanted. I think that's pretty cool. And if you think something as complex as the human brain or the human body happened by chance over billions of years, you really need some serious help. Somebody might have taught you. Some people are very highly educated, way beyond their intelligence, to the point where they believe they came from a rock. And all the matter in the universe fit in a dot. They, they really believe that. I feel sorry for them. Um, let's see. Uh, 349, okay, 349. I would like to distinguish carefully between the six, in my last 40 seconds, there are six different meanings to this word evolution. And the burden of proof is on Mark tonight. Is there scientific evidence for evolution? Is there any scientific evidence for the Big Bang? We'll cover that if you'd like. Is there any scientific evidence for chemical evolution where one chemical can become, can form itself out of something else? Hydrogen, helium, lithium. How do you get up to past iron? There's no evidence for that. We've got all kinds of kinds of stuff on that. There's no, there's no evidence for stellar or planetary evolution. There's no evidence for macro evolution. There's no evidence at all that any animal has ever produced offspring other than its kind. It just doesn't happen. You believe it, you SpongeBob imagination guys, oh, you believe it'll happen, but it's not science. There's no evidence for organic evolution. I rest my case, go ahead. All right, perfect timing, 12 minutes right on the dot. I appreciate the uh, opening statements from the both of you, Dr. Dino and Mark Drysdale. Questions are flying in, guys. I appreciate you tagging me with your questions. Uh, make sure, again, you're tagging me at Standing for Truth. And we're going to be moving into the eight-minute uninterrupted rebuttal portion of the, of the debate. Mark, I see you got the camera fixed, so I think we are good to go. Let me unmute you. And... Mark, whenever you're comfortable, whenever you're ready, you just let me know, and the floor is yours for up to uh, up to eight minutes for a response. Okay, I just had a call come in, so I got to figure out how to turn my speaker back. Speaker, is that better? Um, okay, yes. now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Now, how do I get back? Okay, there we go. Sorry, I had a call come in. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, okay, no. so instead of, going up, instead of going a full eight minutes, what I'd like to do is just go over Kent's stuff one at a time because th this is the standard creationist way. They just put down so much crap that you can't possibly go over all this. The only thing that's going against Kent here is he's been doing this all for so many years. He's been misunderstanding it for so many years that it kind of becomes very predictable. So let's go after these things one at a time. Kent, that thing that you just flipped upside down and made the several layers out of, do you have that for us? I can't hear Kent, right? We can't have a discussion back oh. and forth at this point. I think, uh, Dr. Oven, it says that somebody on your end muted you. So I, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, we got it back on. Is the question about, have I had the little, had, had the sand yeah. on? Has, has any of those layers turned to solid rock? Have any of the layers turned to solid rock? I yeah. suppose if, if, the, if they were mud layer, they would still form in mud. And if I removed okay. the lid off the jar where they could dry out, yeah, they would turn to solid rock. 
See, there's solid there's rock, eh? Rock. You think that sand would turn to solid rock if you took that water out of that sand? No, I said. How long do you think it would take? The layers that we see today are sedimentary rock. Sediments. How do they become rock? rock? How do they become rock? This one, the sand toe. I don't know if the sand, there is such a thing as sandstone, you know, Mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Did it turn, did it, was it sand and did it turn to rock? Absolutely. It turned to rock. Have we ever seen a sand beach in a year or two years or a hundred years or even a thousand years? Have we ever seen a sand, the, the Sahara Desert? Have we ever seen it turn to rock? I just want Have to jump in real it? quick. I'm still stopping the timer. Don't worry. I just wanted to clarify. So for your eight minutes, Mark, you don't mind kind of interacting with? with no, not Mark? at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it gets too long. Okay. But, but this is Kent's. I know this is an evolution, but this is Kent's argument for these things all the time. He comes up with these ridiculous little toys and tries to tell us, look at how it just settled into layers. Yeah, well, all the layers in that toy are, are gravity specific to do that. That that's just a fact. So Kent, that that will never turn to rock. Not in a million years. You would have to bury it deep. You have to uh, subject su subject it to a ton of pressure and heat for it to turn even to sandstone, which is one of our lightest stones. It's it's a lot like um, um, j just like clay. Clay turns into uh, um, limestone, basically, just crappy stone, easily erodes. But even at that, takes thousands and thousands of years to erode like you've got kent talking about the grand canyon blowing itself out in a week because it overtopped a uh, a spillway come on kent i live down by uh, niagara falls i've been watching it for i'm 53 now so i've been watching it for 45 years of my life and i think it's backed up eight inches and that's just crappy limestone that's not even uh granite or any of our more um solid of rock so so you really got to stop when you're telling people this stuff and you're talking about the ocean like it, it the tides go back and forth and churn up the bottom of the ocean no they don't kent the energy is all at the at the surface of the uh of the ocean nothing on the bottom ten thousand feet down gets gets stirred up well what are you talking about Th this just doesn't happen and if you want to know that it doesn't happen next time there's a wave breaking over your head just dive down two feet. It'll go over you and you won't even know it was there. You'll just hear a little crash of it coming over the top of you. There's so many things that you get so wrong. And somehow you've got these people just standing there in awe that, that you're saying intelligent things. You're not. This, this is really getting bad. Your endogenous retrovirus insertion. So now you're saying that God put viruses into man and he did it in a sequence over, well, it's, we know for sure it, it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, because we can count the years back um, through generational uh, watching it go through. Well, you don't believe that we came from chimpanzees or apes or anything, but we can see it inserting itself over time. And you are absolutely right. I wasn't even going to bring it up. But um, for, for the embryo to develop, some of these retroviruses are being shown to be needed. What, God made it so we had to have a virus in our body and that we would accept viruses easily? Did he realize that we would accept smallpox easily? Did he realize that rabies would kill us and just left an open door for things to kill us because we're sinners? Come on, Kent, that this stuff is getting so weak and you've been told so many thousands of times that this this is this is just not even true and no i don't believe in the bible there was no jesus well why would there be why do we need jesus's why do we need gods we, we don't need them anymore we understand stuff go ahead ken all right let me just check the timer on that one okay yeah we oh. A couple minutes to spare, so we'll throw that into... Well, we can throw it into the discussion, actually. Well, We've no, I'll take my next two minutes. I just don't have a clock here. You know, Ken, Ken also talked about no death before sin. So these viruses are still alive in our bodies? Is, is that the fact, Ken? Because they are viruses. And as a matter of fact, they took a endogenous retrovirus. It's online. You can read the paper. We won't get too deep. But they actually were able to bring it back to life. 
something that hasn't been around for millions of years. So you can't just say, well, no, it was never a semi-living organism, which a virus is. It's not a true living organism. It needs a cell to reproduce. But at any rate, um, they brought it back to life. So you can't just say, well, it's just RNA. No, it's not. They're RNA, they're DNA of a semi-living organism. So yes, there was death before sin. And I don't know what this sin is. I guess it's um, how bad we are and the guilt that we're supposed to feel um, in life. But, you know, there's just so many things, Kent. You talk about the layers. How the heck did oil get down uh, 700 meters or, or seven kilometers? How did it get down there in a nice, neat little pack? And then uh, all of a sudden mud rolled on top of it. And then another seven kilometers of mud um, from your flood, you talk about new dirt and, and new material. Where did all this new material come from? Because we still have our mountains. We still have everything. So I just have so many lists here of stuff that, that you talk about that we're not going to have any fossilization in the future. Where's your proof for that? Where, where are you just pulling that out of, Kent? Why would you say we're not going to have fossilization in the future? That that's just a ridiculous statement. It, it's unprovable. Um, and you're, you're willing to, to say that, uh, that sand is going to turn to rock, but you're not willing to say that bone in the future is going to be replaced by minerals. It's just a bizarre talking point that you just feel you can just fly through. And if you lay enough of it down, some of it's got to stick, but you've been doing it so long that, that all this stuff is just getting to the point where it's, it's really getting silly. It really is. All right, and that is eight minutes, right on the dot. So that was uh, Mark's eight-minute uninterrupted rebuttal, although uh, Kent and Mark had a little bit of back and forth there. Uh, we're going to give Dr. Hoven now uh, eight minutes of uninterrupted rebuttal time. Then we'll get into a discussion, but I want to make sure that the dis discussion is equally timed and cordial for sure. So, okay, Dr. Hoven, we're going to hand it over to you. Uh, brother, you've got eight minutes on the clock whenever you're ready. All right. Well, I thought the rule was one topic at a time. By my count, he brought up 11 topics in the last eight minutes that I don't have time to answer. I'd like to stick with one topic at a time rule, if you would. And uh, the burden of proof is on him. Where's the evidence for evolution? I don't have to prove creation. I don't have to prove the flood. The pur purpose of the debate is where's the evidence for evolution? Mark would like to force everybody at the point of a gun to have be forced to pay to have the public schools teach evolution. And if you don't, you go to prison. If you don't want to pay the, the tax to pay them to go to, to teach the kids that came from Iraq, you, you go to prison. This is his philosophy is everybody ought to be forced to pay for his religion to be taught in the schools. And evolution is a belief. Nobody's ever seen any plant or animal produce offspring other than its kind. We may have some things we don't understand yet. There are probably things about viruses we don't understand. I think they're an amazing, com amazingly complex organism, viruses. Are they all bad? That seems to be the, the, the tenor of what he said. Oh, viruses, automatic, just the word virus, automatically bad. Apparently they have a use. Maybe we just don't understand them all yet, okay? So there are, I think, but certainly even the DNA code in a virus is mind boggling. It's more complex than a space shuttle, just one virus. And talk about a living organism. How did this come alive? How, did it, how do you get a virus to develop bit by bit from a dot of nothing smaller than a period on a page. You guys believe we all came from an amoeba or a single cell creature. Where's the information coming from to build any of these living things, even the viruses? So your whole theory is based, your whole religion, Mark, is based on the faulty assumption that mutations make something new and better. That's never been observed. Nobody's ever seen a beneficial mutation. Then you say natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Again, it's a religion of death. Natural selection selects the good one to live and all the rest have to die. This is evil philosophy. Evolution is not only dumb, it's evil, okay? It's a religion of death, not life. They talk about mutations in the textbooks. Mutations are the original source of variation in populations. I agree mutations happen and probably all the rose varieties we have today are mutants from the original rose, but they're still a rose. Darwin said it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Well, Charlie, you can believe that if you want, but that's not science. It's a lie. There's no evidence for it at all. And Mark is supposed to present evidence for why he thinks all, why, why, why he believes evolution is true. 
There is no reasonable evidence for anybody to believe that a cow ever produced a non-cow or a dog produced a non-dog. There's, no there's no evidence to believe what that would happen. Mutations, no matter how numerous they may be, do not produce any kind of evolution. They rearrange existing information. Here's a bull with five legs. It did not make any new information. It already had the information to make a leg. It just made one in the wrong spot. It didn't make a wing or a beak. It made an extra leg and they already have legs. There is no scientific evidence to support the evolution theory. I'm gonna change that to religion, except lies proven years ago. If evolution exists, show me. If there's evidence, where is it? Don't lie and tell the students to make them, but they gotta believe this theory. There's a short-legged sheep, that's a mutant. It was capitalized on. The farmer said, hey, we don't have to build a tall fence. Let's breed a bunch of these. Okay, great. It's still a sheep and it's not beneficial to the sheep. He's the first one the wolf is gonna catch. Here's a two-headed turtle, that's mutant. Not ninja, but it's mutant. It'll die first winter. Nobody makes a double neck turtle neck sweater that I've ever seen. Rearranging existing information does not create anything new. You can rearrange the letters in the word Christmas and get all kinds of words, but you're never gonna get Xerox, zebra, or queen. This textbook tried to answer, they said, oh, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. Oh, a mutation, wow. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Then the book says, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Whoa, whoa, stop. Why didn't you show a beneficial mutation? Why did they show a bad one, which is all there are, and say, see, beneficial mutations is how it works, boys and girls. Well, show me a good one, teacher. Show me a beneficial mutation that's ever added information to the gene code that now you got the problem, if there could find one, it's you gotta get two of the opposite sex in the same place. And they gotta find each other, fall in love, get married and have kids, and the kids have to survive. You got a whole bunch of problems for your theory. It's pure SpongeBob imagination. Just imagine if we had enough mutations, the amoeba could turn to a whale. Just imagine, boys and girls. It's dumb. I think it's evil to teach that to kids, okay? One professor said, I think I've got evidence for evolution, a beneficial mutation. People with sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. Well, that's brilliant. If you cut off your hands, you can't get, uh, you can't get handcuffed either. Cut off your feet, you can't get athlete's foot. That's a beneficial mutation. Now, it's, it's, they're detrimental. There is no evidence, no reasonable evidence to believe this evolution religion that Mark has chosen to believe in. He can believe it all he wants, that's fine, go ahead. You Canadians believe some strange things anyway. But there's no evidence to believe any animal has ever produced a different kind of animal. Natural selection can only select. It can't create anything. Creationists have no argument with natural selection. It's a, it's a conservative process that keeps the defective genes from taking over. It keeps the species pure. Natural selection does not have a creative force doesn't create anything. Natural selection cannot create properties. Evolution in action. Since Darwin's book was published, this textbook says, life science book for junior high, finches with larger and stronger beaks were better able to open the tough pods. Evolution by natural selection had occurred in just one year. This is pure propaganda. Some of the, the birds already had a beak. Some of the birds already had a stronger beak. So when they had a drought come through and only the tough seeds survived, only the tough big birds survived. It didn't create anything new. It didn't give the birds a jackhammer or a pliers to open the nut. It just made the strong beak one survive. That's all they have, Donnie and Mark. All, the, all you evolutionists have is evidence of something that is being selected from an already existing gene code. You could probably go through the Canadian population and kill everybody who didn't have you know, red hair if you wanted and then go back 30 years later and do it again. And you do that enough times and pretty soon the whole population's got red hair. You didn't create anything. You selected a slice of an existing population. That's all natural selection does. Natural selection can lead to evolution, this textbook says. That's a bold-faced lie. I'll debate every, every atheist on the planet on that topic right there. Where's the evidence for natural selection producing anything? If you had a factory that worked made cars and you worked in quality control and you found every single mistake coming down the line and you rejected it, how long would it take that selection process to turn the car to an airplane? It's not gonna do it. It doesn't work. You don't have a mechanism to explain your evolution. You don't have any evidence for it. You don't have any mechanism for it. And you sure don't have an, evidence, you sure don't have an answer for where the original material came from and how life got started so that you could start selecting. 
You don't have an answer for any of those. Mark, you've chosen a dumb religion. I suggest you think it through one more time. Your turn. Go ahead. All right. That is eight minutes. And that concludes the uh, opening statements and the rebuttals. Um, we're now moving into the open discussion, everybody's favorite part of the debate. The topic, again, for tonight, is there reasonable evidence for evolution? we got a great chat right now, roughly 300 people. I want to make sure that this uh, discussion portion uh, focuses on one point at a time, and uh, both Mark and Kent feel like they're getting uh, equal time to address each other's points and uh, make the points that, that they want to make. Also, quick disclaimer, as important as it is and as fun as it would be, uh, let's avoid the vaccine topic for this discussion as uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, risk this epic, epic debate uh, being flagged uh, here on YouTube. So that being said, Mark, why don't we uh, kind of hand it to you because Kent just ended with his rebuttal. We'll allow you to ask the first question or make the first point and we'll go from there. Okay, what I want to do going back and forth here to pin Kent down a little bit, because um, this this snake style of debate has to end. So let's do one question for one answer, and then Kent can go and we'll go back and forth. So when I ask a question, I want an answer to it. I don't want to hear about the Grand Canyon. I don't want him to go flying off on some tangent that doesn't even, even exist. So um, one of the things that I want to ask you, Kent, do you believe that an elephant and a woolly mammoth at one point were related and came from a common um, ancestor? I would have no way of knowing that. We see certainly elephants. We see certainly woolly mammoths. They might have both been created. I don't think anybody could possibly answer that question. You can believe that if you'd like, um, but I, I, don't see, I don't see any possible way to know. We can't go back in time. We're kind of locked in 2022 right now. We can't go back. So I think uh, they certainly look very similar. They have follow the same design pattern. I would say it would be reasonable to assume that maybe they did, but it certainly could not be proven scientifically. Okay, actually, it can be because we have perfectly, um, perfectly beautiful specimens that we can get DNA out of that we can, they're, they're right there, they have hair, they still have their teeth, they still have their horns. And yes, they are, they are descendants, no different from an Asian elephant to an African elephant to the woolly mammoth that walked um, North America and other uh, northern latitudes. So my question to you then is, um, if the woolly mammoth, the Asian elephant, and the um, African elephant look so much alike and can be proven genetically to come from the exact same source, what is the difference that you see in an ape and a man that would tell you that there's absolutely no way that they come from the same stock or come from the same point of separation and then evolved into what they are. What do you really see? I'll even throw monkeys in there so you have the tail to deal with. So apes, monkeys, chimpanzees, bonobos, all of them. What, what difference do you see between man and our fellow primate? Our fellow primates. Whoa, what a loaded statement that is. You might be related to one. I am not, okay? Uh, I think the fact that there is similar you, you know, false premise in your origin there, original question about, you know, because they have DNA, DNA similarities between, you know, African elephant, Asian elephant, uh, woolly mammoth and mastodon. Therefore, that proves they're related. No, it doesn't. There are many similarities. I've got probably 4,000 books here in my library. All of them use the same basic code of 26 letters. That's just a code. That's what you write English with. Okay. So the fact that uh, animals have a similar DNA code does not prove a relationship. This is your imagination running wild, Mark. It might be that they're related. I probably could prove that uh, my son or my daughter are related to me genetically, with, but I don't know that I could prove uh, you know, my ancestry back for thousands of years. We can try. But see, that kind of stuff, gets, it starts to leave science and get into imagination, fairy tale stuff. So to be your question, you had, had a false premise about them. We don't know that the mammoth and elephant are related. We can believe that. They may be, but it's not been proven. But Apes and humans and chimpanzees and uh, bonobos and uh, uh, go gorillas and orangutans all have lots of differences. Can they interbreed? Do the, are the, do the apes show any interest whatsoever in the gorillas to crossbreed with them? If you don't know what the same kind of animal is in most of the uh, questionable areas, ask the males. They'll tell you. They'll chase the female of their kind. They can figure it out. Our squirrels around here show no interest whatsoever in the rabbits. None. We have llamas, alpacas, miniature horses. They all mate after their kind. They know what the same kind is. So no, I think you'll find if you turned them all loose in the woods, 
the monkeys would seek out the monkeys and the apes would seek out the apes and not, not never, never a twain between. It doesn't happen. It's imagination. So you can believe you're related to a monkey and obviously you think you are. I'll leave that up to you to settle with the, you, uh, you and your monkey friends, but I, I don't believe I am. I think there's certainly a lot of differences intellectually. Well, I know some cases where it's not that great a difference, but uh, I think there are differences genetically and there's enough differences that we're a different kind. They show no interest in mating. They certainly have different uh, habits. They have obviously different cleanliness habits. I don't think you'll find any monkey ever capable of typing out a single sentence. Train a monkey to type out uh, the Gettysburg Address. I'd like to see that. Humans can be taught and trained and learn new skills and use lots of different tools. Monkeys sometimes take a stick and poke it down the hole. They call that using a tool. They, no, nothing similar to what man has done. They're, they're just, man is so far out, out of the class of all the animals. I think plants have a body. Animals are different than plants. Animals have a body and a consciousness of life. Man has a body, a consciousness of life, and a consciousness of God. You won't find a single monkey or ape or bonobo or gorilla ever looking up to heaven saying, thank you, God. Never. They don't do it. They don't believe it. They don't, even, they don't think about God. At least humans, some of them, think about it. There's giant differences. We have a spiritual side to us. We have a soul, Mark, a soul. Yes, there's lots of differences. You can be related to them if you want. I'm not. Go ahead. Mark, take equal time. Go ahead. So <laughs> there's the tangents that I'm talking about, going down all kinds of different rabbit holes. Uh, it's hard to even uh, remember a lot of what he said. So you do know, you talked about red hair, that we could start killing off people with red hair. and We'd end up uh, or only keeping people. I forget what you said. Do you understand that red hair doesn't, have a purpose as far as evolution goes unless man found red-headed women more attractive or men the other way around you know what i'm saying but let's take black skin for example ken where do we find people with black skin uh i have actually never seen a black man i've seen you know what i'm talking about ken. what we consider no, no, I don't. No, I don't. a black I've skinned a black person i've never seen a white man mark this is white I'm not white. You're not white. I've never seen a white man, never seen a black man. I've seen all different shades of brown, some pretty dark, some pretty light. So I think the, the, those living near the equator or those exposed to a lot of sunshine, those with darker skin seem to be protected more from skin cancer and problems with that. So they probably would survive better. It might be a case of natural selection, selecting darker skin to survive in some climates and lighter skin to survive in other climates. But Again, I don't know that that could be proven. That could be theorized. So, yes, I believe all humans, dark or light skinned, are, are related. I've never seen a black man. So, so no, you're, you're absolutely wrong. The skin color stops it from being able to absorb too much sunlight. And uh, that is why it's there. And that is a good example of something that if it hadn't evolved, it would have died. And that is us. And us to the north with dark skin do not get enough of the vitamins that we need out of the sun. So we are designed to absorb it or die, and they are designed to reject it or die. So there is a perfect example of of evolution. And I know you tried to bring in that there was some kind of a racist uh, tone to that. My wife happens to be, or my girlfriend happens to be a black lady and they prefer to be called black, not brown. So she is a black woman and uh, she's from Grenada. And fact is, you go down there and they don't suffer in the sun the way we do. They don't get the sunburns that, they, that we do. They take on color, but that skin color is designed through nature to block out the amount of sunshine that can get into your skin, into the organ that's responsible for bringing in the uh, vitamins that we need from the sun. And it, it moderates it. And if that is not moderated properly, we die. So there is a good example of why we have black skinned people near the equator and it goes lighter as you move away from the equator. Now, obviously, with world travel and inner um, interracial uh, relationships, uh, colors have 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 changed and stuff. But you go back to before we had the ability to travel from continent to continent. Um, the color variation is is pretty consistent from the 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 equator all the way out to the ends. So I'm not saying that we ended up with a completely different 
um, a species, obviously we can all interbreed. We are all humans. Um, we are all equals. We're not saying that, but you say that you, you talk about evolution. Like we have to kill things for, for things to evolve. Why do we have to kill things? And what's this death is evil. If death is evil, then God is evil. God is the one that has, has bestowed death on us all for eating an apple. Hey, Donnie, Donnie, we got five topics going here. One topic at a time, please. We got Which one. one. We got Wait, one. What is, what I, I'm what is, you, what is the topic? You asked the me topic about is, where did the dark skinned people come from? I gave an answer. No, no, you that. didn't. You didn't, Ken. You didn't give it. A, 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 you didn't give a. You said, "Oh, maybe it's," but nobody can prove it. What do you mean we can't prove it? Do you think okay, we can't do blood tests? Okay, let's do this, gentlemen. I've been um, uh, keeping track of both of your your times, so it's been between about two to three minutes each per response. So it's been good, uh, Mark. Uh, that was about two and a half minutes. So Kent, let's hand it to you. Equal time, and then uh, if you gentlemen want, we'll move to another point in terms of evolution. So uh, okay, go okay. Ahead. So Mark, you believe darker skin people uh, thrive and do better and actually need to be uh, sunlight uh, down near the uh, closer to the equator, and the further north they get, the more dangerous that is. Yet you brought a Ghanaian woman up to Canada. Are you trying to harm her in some way? I need she needs to have a long talk with somebody about that. Uh, yes, they can interbreed. You're still human. Try try to breed with a chimpanzee. Get a dark or a light skinned one. Find an albino chimpanzee if you'd like. It won't work. Okay. I didn't bring a I didn't bring a Grenadian woman up. She's lived here her entire life. And uh, yes, we, we do have vitamins and minerals that we can take to to adjust, um, you know, limitations of what she would be able to absorb in her skin compared to me. Um, when I go down to the um, equator where I plan on living is down in Grenada in the very near future. I can wear hats. I can do things to keep the sun off my skin. But I, I believe Kent has his his time now to um, to ask a question. We have to kind of go back and forth that way. All right. Okay. So, yeah. My, okay, my question ahead, would be: okay, My question is, Mark. Very simple. Do you believe what you just described, the darker skin or lighter skin, and the way it reacts to the sunlight? Would that process turn an amoeba to a whale over billions of years? Why billions would it? Why? Why? Why would we need it to change a amoeba, amoeba to a tree or to anything? Why? Why would that type of natural selection? Where's the pressure? Where's the pressure to do it? You need pressure. The sun in this case is the pressure. The fact that you can't live if you absorb too much of the sun's um, vitamins or too little is um, is a pressure, and it, it causes us to evolve in that way because the people that are not designed to be in that particular location will not make it they will slowly over generation after generation after generation they will die off where is the pressure for an amoeba to turn to anything other than an amoeba well are we there still amoebas, amoebas around? around are there I mean, still amoebas around trillions of them yeah so what what are you talking about you're trying to make it sound like evolution is linear we've never said that uh, that evolution is linear there's nothing linear about it we we came from an ape we came from a monkey we came from a chimpanzee you no know, we're related to them you can go back to a chimpanzee which they are actually wow. thinking is where we came from i know it's been ape all along but th they're, they've traced it back to a certain chimpanzee. I just watched it about a year ago. And as a matter of fact, with, with an ape, they just were able to take an ape embryo and put human stem cells into it. And that began to, it started to divide and it started to, um, it started to progress. They kept it alive for, I believe, 70 days or 60 days. You can read about it online. But yeah, I, I don't know where you're thinking that evolution is linear. No one's ever said it's linear. That's a linear way of thinking that an amoeba is all of a sudden going to turn into a tree or an elephant. Why? Who, who would even tell you that? You clearly don't understand what evolution is. Well, I have never said it all of a sudden turned into anything. Look at the textbooks. They show a protista, a single-celled organism, turning into a human, a reptile, a frog, a, st a star urchin, a sea urchin, a mollusk. This is what the textbooks teach. I resent that. 
your phylogenetic trees that I'm sure you believe in have all the animals and all the plants related. Mark, are you related to an oak tree? Kent, that, that chart of evolution that you just held up, your first one there, is the absolute stupidest tree of evolution I've ever seen. I don't know where you got that, but I'm assuming it's preschool. Where have you ever seen a true evolutionary chart? Now, there's a real one. There you go. Where is that showing one animal treeing up like a tree and an amoeba just turning into a starfish? Over here, it became a, 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 a fish. Up here, it became an elephant. No, don't, don't show stuff that you know is not true. And then right after it, three seconds later, you show a proper evolutionary um, tree. Come on, you can't do that. That just shows dishonesty. A proper evolutionary tree. This you, think one, that, you think that kindergarten one that you showed uh, an amoeba turning into a starfish, that that is in any book anywhere on this earth? Or did you make it up? No, no. I, I take right out of the books. Let's see. This one's from uh, the evolution of seed plants. Uh, LumenLearning.com shows a tomato and a soybean and a grape and moss go back to a common ancestor. You will find charts. I can find them by the thousands for you showing all animals, all life forms, going back to a common ancestor, which was an amoeba or a protista, a single-celled creature. Do you believe over quadrillions of years, an amoeba will turn into a whale? Quadrillions of years? Where's quad quadrillions of years okay. coming from? You, you Kent, you're an home. educator. Come on, man. We've got 13.7. I'm trying to educate you. Come on, well, man. You don't, you don't do it by being by being silly. Quadrillions of years. We got 13.7 okay. billion what? years and, and that okay. we're dealing with. We got 4.5 billion years on Earth. After about three or 400 million years, yes, we started to get single-celled animals. Not quadrillion. We're not even talking okay. numbers like that. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that I will give you all the time you want. Now go back to the question. You fill in the time. Did an amoeba turn to a whale? And you fill out, take all, how, did, it, did it turn to a whale at all? And you tell me how much time it took. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No amoeba ever turned into a whale. And then you throw it up your hand like you've won some kind of battle. Who would ever say that? Do you, do you ever hear an evolutionist say, look, Kent, we came from this bird? No, we say that we came from apes, chimpanzees. We don't do ridiculous things like that. Now, you want to go back and start tracing um, mammals back through where we divide it off with rodents and stuff like that. Sure. But th this isn't something that there's one or two lines. There's millions of lines, Kent, and there's dead ends where animals just did not make it. The environment changed too much or we had a... a, a a catastrophe that just wiped them out and allowed another animal to live on. So no, 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 no amoeba turned into any massive uh, mammal. No, no, not even close. It's just a complete okay. misunderstanding. Uh, if you read that in a textbook, I'm telling you, get that textbook off the shelf because it's a creation. Yay, now we're talking. Because it's a creation of textbook off the shelf. Now, Mark, I didn't, inter I didn't interrupt you. Don't interrupt me. Hope Biology textbook sitting right here on my shelf says, shows a picture of mammals on the far upper right corner having a line drawing back to a common ancestor with lizards and turtles and birds. Do you believe mammals and birds have a common ancestor with lizards in any number of generations you want? Of course they do. Okay, Mark, but do you Ken, believe... Look Look at you look, believe you are related that. to a robot. I, 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 let's just allow Kent to finish it. I, I want to make okay, sure. Okay, go ahead. Talk. Okay, go ahead. Just Mark, change subject. Do you, do you believe you are related to a strawberry? Of course we are. Okay. Of course we are. We know we're all related, but that doesn't mean that a strawberry turned into a man. Oh, I never Come said on. it did. And, and, and even even this chart that you have up right now on your. Your thing, do your people realize how incredibly dumbed down that is? These lines of division are multiple millions of separations. They're not just all of a sudden you have a lizard and over here we have a rodent and then over here we have this. And it's, it's a ridiculous 
thing that you're showing and you're doing it on purpose and it's dishonesty. If you were to, to look at a proper chart of evolution that we've, we've put together um, through genetics and through um, um, layers, like you say, that don't exist and, and evidence in the fossils, there's millions and millions and millions of separations. We, we are down to, I think they say it's 0.1% of the animals that have existed still exist. So you're leaving a hell of a lot out tons and tons and tons of information and if you go at something with not an information not enough information or bad information you're going to get the wrong answer every time all right go ahead we'll make sure equal time kent uh okay mark i could find you tens of thousands of charts that have been made showing lines on paper with all life forms connected to a common ancestor, typically a one-celled creature like a protista or an amoeba. I agree, this is a cartoon version, but this is exactly what they teach, that the first living, first true cells developed over thousands, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, sextillions, octillions, give you all the generations you want. This is showing the kids that an amoeba or a protista turned into a human, slowly, over billions, trillions of generations. That's what it's showing them. This is not science. The purpose of this debate tonight is for you to show evidence of how any animal has ever produced anything different, let alone trillions of differences to turn to an amoeba to a human. Where is an example of one amoeba producing anything besides an amoeba or protista? Where's the scientific evidence, Mark? You got a religion, you got a dumb one, change it. Go ahead. So that was your question? The question. You're done that portion? Yeah, we'll leave it at that. I'm just saying those charts are, are extremely juvenile. They're designed to teach kindergarten students um, the basics so that we wouldn't have to stand up in front of them with a, a board 10 feet by 10 feet to show them all the divisions that we have. Even that one is, is very, very simplified. It only covers uh, animals probably that are still around. But at, at any rate, so you, you always talk about this chemical evolution. I, I, I assume you're talking about where do the elements come from? Why do you have so much troubles understanding the elements, uh, Kent? Um, you know that when things burn, we can tell exactly what's in there through the spectrum of, of looking at the different light um, divisions. So we can see exactly what's in there as far as all the elements go. So we look at all the stars and we see the exact same element makeup right up to iron. Every time we see the exact same thing, nothing shocks us. Doesn't matter how big the star is, even if it's uh, billions of solar masses bigger than our, our sun, we still see the same thing all the way up to iron. So why is it that you call it chemical evolution when if you look at the synthetic elements, we've made them. So we know how elements are made and we know that it takes extreme pressure and extreme heat to start injecting um, electrons and protons into a, a atom and make a new element. We've done it. They're, uh, most of them are very unstable, radioactive, but we've done it. So why are you so confused about it? We see stars blow up. We know exactly how they blow up. We can calculate the pressure that they would be blowing up as when they become a nova or a supernova. Why are you so confused about that? It's still trying to say that we don't understand this chemical evolution. What about that has, has you uh, really confused here? Okay, let's stop there real quick. That was about two minutes uh, with a couple questions in there. So Kent, go ahead. You got about two minutes as well. Well, he, he evaded the original question and went on to a totally new topic. Where is the evidence of an amoeba ever producing anything other than an amoeba? Amoebas have a very short generation time they get, get born, grow up, get married, and have kids in about, what, 20 or 30 minutes, some of them. So you could raise thousands of generations, tens of thousands, in one human lifetime. Has any scientist ever seen an amoeba produce a non-amoeba? Mark? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing for sure, Kent. I don't think you've ever seen an amoeba grow up and get married and breed with another amoeba. So we're just gonna pretend you didn't even say that. That is the most embarrassing thing I think I've ever heard somebody say. Um, we're gonna leave that alone. So Kent thinks right. that amoebas breed with each other and have babies. So 
we'll leave it at that. So where I thought we were going is it doesn't matter where we go. This will all keep, keep, this is all subjects you've brought up. I've written them all down. So I thought we were going to do a question and answer. Once we were done our answer, we would move on to another question. I don't want to keep beating these things to death. No, amoebas do not turn into oak trees. They don't turn into humans. No, not how it works. And they don't interbreed. Okay, okay, uh, you're right. Uh, so, some some single cell creatures do breed. Some do not. They simply use mitosis, meiosis. I'm familiar with that. Okay, this some chart here. Cell, some single celled animals breed. Some single celled animals cross uh, share share DNA with others. Similar, we would call it breeding. Oh yeah. There's, okay, there's meiosis I would and love. Mitosis. I would love. I would love the next time we get together for you to show me that. So okay. I thought we were going to go back and forth okay. with, with with questions. So I, I'm willing. Okay, wait a minute. Let's, I I don't want right. to beat stuff to death. Okay, let's do no. this. Let's change it. Let's, let's, let's allow Kent to uh, finish. Okay. I, I want to rephrase my question, Your Honor. Instead well, of an I amoeba. I have a question. Oh, no! You changed the subject to stars. Yeah, we're okay. not going to stay. We're not going to stay on your amoeba thing all night, are we? Well, Mark, I've got my chart here from Hope Biology Textbook, an accredited school, university, uh, somebody wrote this book, uh, fully accredited uh, teachers uh, teach from this. This shows an early reptile turning into a mammal, a bird, a crocodile, a snake, a uh, turtle. Do you believe this rep any reptile has ever produced anything other than a reptile baby? You think that 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 chart you're looking at is a accurate representation of what they're trying to get across in a book that is six inches wide by eight inches high you think that that's a full example that you have a i forget what you said i, I think you said an early reptile turning into a mammal and i can see it there that it does it in two steps do you think that's realistic on what we think or do you think we think it did it through thousands of transitional animals this thousands is real Mark, this is realistic of what is taught, okay? I've got the books to prove it. Now, no, it's not realistic. If the chart was bigger, make a chart as big as Arizona, okay? Put as many lines on there as you want. Where is the evidence for any reptile ever producing anything other than a reptile baby? Where's the evidence? Doesn't happen. How, how, how would you know that? Nobody and ever seen it. Ken, another thing that you've got to understand, and th this is an answer to your question, is you've got to stop believing that in high school, in college, in university, when they teach um, math, when they teach English skills, when they teach science, physics, these aren't the endings of, of education. At that point, you go on and you you learn full out math. You, you, you spend the next eight years of your life learning about math or science or physics or evolution or whatever the case may be. This These books you're talking about, like they're, they're the gospel, they're introductions to people. Even if it's a university, it's still an introduction course. It usually, my daughter just went through to become a veterinarian. It's usually a month or two spent on each subject as the introduction, and then she takes four to eight years becoming a veterinarian in animal health. These are introductions. These aren't the, the be-all and end-all of our education. I hope you realize that, that our, our specialists go on and they spend their entire lives learning about this stuff. This isn't as simple as you want to make it out to be because it's in a book in a high school. No, no. Go ahead, Kent. Okay. Mark, let me dumb it down, make it real simple for you here. Once again, this, where is the evidence of any reptile producing babies that did not be, were not reptile? Because well, somewhere along the line, this reptile turned into a bird and a mammal on the chart, whether there's 10 billion lines in there and 10 trillion steps, I don't know. But where's the evidence of it even going one step? Well, well Ken, you, step. You, you don't believe in fossils and you don't believe in genetics. So how could I possibly say anything to you that you're going to accept? You don't even don't believe, believe that fossils. you don't even believe that stars form and blow up. <laughs> so how am I supposed to convince you that a fossil is real? You don't think fossils are still making themselves. Mark, I believe in fossils. We have a collection of probably 50,000 fossils here in our museum. We believe in fossils. We you believe don't. fossils. Are, I think fossils are clear evidence something died. This was a clam that died. Could I prove You're it telling, had children? No. 
Could I prove it had different children? No. Clams are still having babies today, and they always grew up to be clams. Where's the evidence of a clam producing a non-clam? But a fossil's you- not going to tell you that. No fossils are going to count as evidence for your dumb religion. Mark, come on. You just told me that no fossils are going to be made now because they won't be made under the uh, under the 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 flood. So, no, you do not believe in fossils. Fossilization is just the replacement of bone with minerals, Kent. You just told me at the beginning of this that no new fossils are going to be made. There will be no new fossils in the future. We have made our last fossil. Fossils are forming today. I'd like to see the evidence of certainly not in the mass graves like we find all over the world with tens of thousands, maybe even millions of animals buried in one big mass grave. You'd almost think they died in Noah's flood if you didn't know better. No. We have clams that are petrified closed on top of Mount Everest ought to indicate something to somebody with one functioning brain cell. This thing died and was buried while it was alive. Where is the evidence of fossils forming in any number? Sure, they can form. Where is it happening? And if you found a fossil, and this is your evidence for evolution, you couldn't prove any fossil that in any museum had any children that lived. Could you? Kent, do you believe that that clam in Noah's Ark made its way, in Noah's flood, made its way to the top of Mount Everest? If that is the case, how do you explain corals that we find at thousands of feet of ev- of elevation that we know coral, we know how fast it grows. So how do you explain that? Did that wash up there too? And it, it, coral, big chunks of coral washed up onto mountain ranges? How about the cliffs of Dover? How do you explain that? Well, we got five topics are going in, Donnie. Nope, Here we go again. Nope, See, same Mark one, avoid- elevation, <laughs> elevation and coral. Mark, okay, you've avoided ahead. my question four times. I'm going to try one more time. Where okay. is the where is the scientific evidence of any reptile producing anything other than a reptile? So it sounds to me like all you will take as evidence would be a cave painting or who knows what. You've, I've already told you, Kent. I've answered it. You will not accept fossils and you will not accept genetics. So I have nothing more for you. I don't have any pictures of a lizard turning into a mammal. I don't have pictures. I may be able to find you some cave paintings, but your problem is you will not accept evidence. You will not look down at your little sand toy and realize that it still hasn't turned into rock. And it won't in a million years. That's a fact. So what I'm saying, Kent, is we've beaten this one to death. It's your talking point. I've asked you a lot of questions that I want explained, and you're doing exactly what I knew you would do, is dodge everything and keep going back to one point. I brought up chemical evolution. I brought up a lot of questions for you, and you just want to keep going back to that. So I'm telling you, I have no evidence that you will accept. None. Thank you, sir. Zero. 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 Why, do we, why do we teach the kids then that reptiles turned into birds and mammals? That is because what's taught we, in schools. Mark, do you believe, we, birds, you believe this chart teaches the general idea of what's true, that a bird came from an, a reptile over millions of years, trillions, quadrillions, whatever you want, give all the time you want. Do you believe in any amount of time a reptile turned to something non-reptile? And the purpose of this debate, the title is, where's the evidence for this? You've offered no evidence. Genetics is not going to provide evidence. Genetics could provide evidence that they have a common designer. It doesn't prove their religion or what changed. Sure it does. It's exactly what does it. It's how we know so sure. It's how we started off with retroviruses. This stuff isn't just one layer thick. There's hundreds of layers that prove evolution. You won't accept them. So I'm admitting to you, I will never convince you of evolution. But I expect children in school after grade one or two to also understand their chemistry classes, to also understand the biology classes, to also understand geography classes, put all this, all the sciences together and understand that when we say something about uh, genetics or fossils, that it is something that there's people out there, very serious people have put aside an entire lifetime of learning to learn about. They don't just stand back with little sand toys and make things up that that sound good. These are people that spend their lives and there's thousands of them doing it. 
arguing with each other until they come up with the right answer. So I'm saying to you, stop beating this to death. You know I'm not going to be able to say anything to you. Uh, what could I possibly say? You don't accept genetics. You don't accept fossils. We're done. There's nothing more I can say to you. Okay, so move on, Mark. ask a new question, entirely new thing Mark. that has something to do with the hundreds of things you've brought up. Okay, Mark, I do accept the fact there are billions or trillions of fossils in the ground. I accept that. I've dug them out, many of them myself. We got a huge collection here. I accept there are fossils. I do accept the fact you could not prove any of them had children. You certainly could not prove a fossil found in the bone you found in the dirt had children that were different. Many people raise reptiles today. Snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, there are tens of thousands of them being raised by people who specialize in this, herpetologists. Has anybody alive today ever seen any reptile produce a non-reptile? And the answer is no, but you dodged it six times. Nobody's ever seen that. But you believe if we give it enough time, reptiles would turn to a bird. That's what you believe. That's what the kids are taught. You want them taught that in school, don't you, Mark? That reptiles turn to birds over millions of years. Of course we do. Of course we want them taught taught proper biology and evolution. Of course we want it. We want it taught that way. That's not biology. But Kent, you're a person that wants to try to tell your people that a two-headed snake or a five-headed snake is an example of evolution messing up. No, come on. That, that, you don't know what they are. Do you not know what Siamese twins are and conjoined uh, animals that, that they started out as two embryos and, and joined in the, the womb or the egg? Come on. You don't bring stuff like this up unless you're just trying to fool simple minded people. It, it's such a dishonesty. It's, it's getting bad. It really is. But go ahead, let's let's move on. I cannot okay. prove evolution to you as far as fossils go or as far as DNA goes. But you've brought up all kinds of other things to prove um, ev- that to prove that evolution is wrong. You brought up chemical evolution. You've brought up tons and st- even right down to how do I know what's right and wrong as proof of, of that evolution didn't exist, that we had to have a creator. So you're the one that's taken this off into tons of different um, directions. So I just ask you, out of all those things that you opened up in your opening statement, ask a question so I can try to answer it. Okay. I said, and I've said thousands of times, and I'll continue to say it, the word evolution is a slippery word with many different meanings or levels or stages. You'd have to start off with cosmic evolution to explain where you get time, space, matter. Where do you get matter to even start the evolution process? Where did the rock come from? Where did the hydrogen gas come from? Where did the star, where did the the stars do have material and you can see it with the spectroscope. I understand completely, but we never see this matter forming out of nothing. You guys have to start with nothing like I do. God, outside of our time space matter, created everything. I think man can take dirt out of the ground, get separate the iron, turn it into a car. I think man can do that, get iron ore. I don't think the iron ore can do it by itself, but I think an intelligent mind can take the iron ore and turn it to a car. I believe that. You guys want to take the iron ore and turn it to a car without a man doing it. You want to take the dirt. God can take dirt and make Adam. You guys want the dirt to make Adam by himself, without just by itself. That you give the dirt the characteristics of God, able to do things. Where did matter come from? Where did time come from? Where did space come from? And if there was a Big Bang 13.772 billion years ago, what was before that? It was energy. There was no. There was no matter. There was no. Where did the energy come from? There was a, give me a ball of energy. Would you give me a gallon of it or a liter in your case, Canadian? It's all around you right now. Anything that's above uh, um, zero degrees uh, Kelvin is, or uh, is energy, Kent. There's tons of energy and we see energy going back and forth between, uh, between matter and back to energy and matter going back to energy. I, I don't understand why this has you so confused. And that's what I was talking about when it came down to this chemical evolution that you talk about. Stars okay, make... I'm- Stars no, I'm not make elements okay. up to iron, I, and we can make elements past iron, and we do it with pressure and heat. So why are you so confused on how a star blowing up 
um, or going supernova, collapsing in on itself with horrendous amounts of pressure and heat, couldn't start to form new um, new elements. Well, where did you said matter energy can be uh, go back and forth? I understand that you can burn the gasoline and get energy and you know no, power and stuff like that. No, okay, but no, that that is not an example of matter turning into energy. Oh, good lord. Kent, that that is uh, wait, wait, a, wait. Kid, a kid in kindergarten would not believe that that is an example of matter turning into energy or energy turning into matter. But a good example of matter turning well, minute, into Mark. energy. I, I just want to make sure I, I would just, be a I bomb. And I understand your your uh, your saying is wrong, but let's just allow Kent to, I guess, defend himself on that point. Go ahead, Kent. Then we well, hand it to as you. as expected, we are dancing around with fifty different topics. The purpose of the debate no. is for you to provide evidence, scientific evidence, that evolution is true, that any animal has ever produced anything other than its kind. We can have a debate on the Big Bang or chemical evolution if you'd like. There is such a thing that gets all over the internet about chemical evolution. It has to it's lots of stuff on it. How do we get these organic molecules? In order to get life to even started, you have to get, and you said you can fuse up to iron. Very, I'm very glad you know that, Mark. How do you get helium? How do you get gold, silver, and platinum out of iron? I'd like to learn how to do that. I can make get rich. And you can. We you we, can get we gold. already we, know that for the record, you're know. saying you can get gold out of iron. Is that right, Mark? Is that what you said? Kent, do you know the difference between all the elements? Because you're calling chemicals and elements the same thing, which they well, okay. are not. Okay, so so let's let's make this clear. We can turn any atom, we can move it up the, the periodic chain by adding electrons and protons. So where where are you misunderstanding this? It, it, it's 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 so easy to understand how we do it, and that is how we take um, uranium and turn it into other elements up the chain. We bombard it with electrons and protons, and we build new new elements. W what do you mean we can't turn um, iron into gold? Of course we can, Kent. Is it and is it economical? No, we have gold in our earth. And the reason we have so little of it is because it has to be made in supernovas. But we find a ton of iron, a ton of stuff that comes out of uh, uh, stars, but we don't find the stuff that you, you'd have to have these very high pressure explosions as much. So as you go up chemically, you'll notice that there's less and less of it because it's harder to make. So yes, of course, iron is going to be very abundant. Look at all the asteroids flying around. They're all made out of iron. They're all iron-based. They're, they're metals. What's confusing well, about this? Mark, they're not all iron. They're stony and nickel and stuff like that. But that, OK, I understand your point. And the, the debate is you're supposed to give evidence for evolution. You got off on cosmic evolution, chemical evolution. I just point out there are six different meanings to the word. And we can talk about that another time. But as far as macroevolution, Nobody's ever seen any animal right there or organic. That's another one. How do you get life started? Go on that if you'd like. But nobody's ever seen any animal produce offspring other than its kind. Nobody's ever seen a reptile produce a non reptile. Put my slides up, Steve. Put my slides up. Okay. Nobody's ever seen a reptile produce a non reptile. Never. Lots of people are raising reptiles. And when they have babies, they always turn out to be reptiles. We got a yes, tortoise yes, here. Yes. I'm going to find a Mrs. Tortoise for him. I would be willing to bet you $1,000, Mark. If we can find a mama tortoise for daddy tortoise, when they have babies, they will be tortoises. I'll bet you $10,000 they'll be tortoises. If okay, an animal... go, Mark, Mark, I, I know you want to respond. I know you want to respond. We're at an hour and a half. We've gone about 10 minutes over on the discussion because it's been so fun and engaging. Let's take we do have a ton question. of, And we do have Let a ton of audience questions. So th 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 just one second. Let we got me a ton answer of that questions. one. Okay, can I answer that? Yes. Well, I was going to say we're going into closing statements. So, Mark, why don't you take up to five minutes to answer that and also okay. make any other points you want to for. to OK, I will Go tell ahead. you right now and I will tell everyone watching if an animal ever gave birth to something that wasn't its kind, I would believe in God. And I swear to you, if tomorrow morning I turned on the news and a cow gave birth to a I would even a deer, something that kind of even looks like a cow, I, I would be 
no, everything's wrong. Everything we know where is wrong. Uh, we must be in the end times. This this cannot happen. That is not evolution. Nobody thinks that that is evolution. I I can't even imagine how Kent can say stuff like that and then shave in the morning looking in the mirror because it is absolutely ridiculous. Nobody thinks that. Those charts that he shows are, are all designed to be kindergarten level charts because they look ridiculous. When you've got this single celled uh, amoeba or whatever he's showing there in one branch turning into a starfish, going off the other way, turning into a lizard, and then going up the center and turning into a fish. Of course, that looks ridiculous. If anyone out there really wants to jar their belief system a little bit, go look at a proper evolutionary chart. Go to Aaron Ra's site. He has put so much work in, into laying out the biology of all the animals. It, it's, it's an incredible body of work that he has done. And it's all there. You can see it. And he's been spending years on this. Do you think the guy that put together Kent's uh, 10 animal evolution chart spent years on that? No. And I don't even honestly think that Aaron will be able to or Aaron will be able to finish what he has started. It will probably go on for generations as we learn and uh, becomes more and more understood. And yes, stuff will be shuffled around and things will be moved as we learn. Um, as we find new fossils, we will shuffle things around. But to look at things at the most basic level to try to make it sound silly, like showing your, your sand thing um, with sand in there that has different specific gravities to show that things will settle out in layers. No, no, they, they don't, Kent. If, if they settled out in layers, we would not have the trees and all the bacteria that made the oil seven kilometers down. Um, I would gladly come down there and have you show me in one year how you could hold trillions and trillions of tons of plant matter down seven kilometers, cover it in water, have it stay there while dirt gently flowed over the top of this and turned to rock. So there, there's just so many things that you try to take it down to the most basic of levels um, so that it's easy to understand. And people, I get it. Science is extremely hard to understand. Everything that I talked about tonight, I don't even know one or two percent about it. I try to learn what I can about uh, five or six topics, but there, there just isn't enough time for, for people to specialize in that many different fields. And that's where the dishonesty comes from. Kent comes in, he starts with these talking points, tries to make it sound like he's, he's educated in this stuff. And you, you've just got to believe me, the, these people that do this, it's lifetimes of work through generations of people. And it's all been adding up and adding up and adding up. And, you know, you go back to what we believe 2000 years ago to what we believe today into what we'll believe in 100 years. Yes, it's going to change. We are constantly learning. Science is not at its pinnacle where we have nothing more to learn. We still have lots to learn. There'll still be lots of changes. But I guarantee you evolution will be around in a thousand years. Um, if man is still here in 2000 years, it'll still be around. It'll just be uh, easier to explain. And we will probably have found a lot more fossils. But um, yeah, you know, Kent didn't even talk about how we get coral up in, in mountains, but he'll bring up the fact that there's a clam on top of Mount Everest completely, um, you know, denying tectonic movement that we completely understand. Um, you know, he brought up so many things tonight and then blamed me for it. You know, where does all the, the, um, the, all the all the stuff he calls it come from to make all the different layers we see mountains breaking down we see sand blowing over from the sahara desert and making it all the way over to the to the uh, to the americas what do you mean kent where does it come from have you never been in a house that there's constant settlement of dust um you know all this stuff is is so obvious we got plates smashing together land rising up and wearing down, that's where it comes from. It runs down with water, we have rain, but it takes millions and millions of years. Okay, that's uh, Mark's concluding statement. I appreciate it. 
uh, between five and six minutes. We're a little more easy going here on the concluding statement. So we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino for his uh, concluding statement as well. Kent, you got between five and six minutes. Go ahead. Evolution is a shell game. The biologist thinks that the geologist has the evidence and the geologist thinks the anthropologist has the evidence. And they all refer to all these other sciences as Mark said, well, there's just so much to learn and it takes years and years and years to be indoctrinated, I mean, to be educated in all this stuff, okay? It doesn't happen, Mark, at all. They say that it's a shell game, but this, there's a big difference here. There's no P under any of them. Nobody has any evidence of any animal ever producing a different kind of offspring, ever. Reptiles are still having babies. They always stay reptile. And you said, if an animal ever gave birth to a different animal, you'd believe in God. Mark, you believe the amoeba gave birth to something slightly non-amoeba, and over millions of generations, it slowly changed to a whale. You better start believing in God then, Mark. I've been piecing together fragmentary evidence for a long time, working on the evolution of the fork. I've dug up lots of fork pieces around this property from the old gravel pit when they used to mine gravel. People apparently ate lunch here. I think I've found the missing link. I believe, after intensive research with no government grant money involved, I believe the knife gradually evolved into the spoon. Probably took millions of years of geologic pressure to dish it out and widen it and shorten it. And then it slowly got erosion, cutting grooves into the end and turned it into a short tine fork. And then over many more millions of years, the grooves got longer and became a long time fork. But I knew all along I had a missing link. I was on US Air one time flying someplace and the stewardess came down the aisle and handed me the missing link. She didn't even know what she had. I thanked her profusely. Then I went to Church's chicken or Popeye's chicken and found another one. I have now found two missing links. The evolution of the sport, a fork is very, getting very complete. I found quite a, few, quite a few mutations along the way. And people knew I was doing research on the evolution of the fork, and they started sending me deliberate frauds, like this one. That's obviously a fork head on a spoon handle. My trained scientific eye caught it right away. I said, nah, that's fake, okay? And of course, there's lots of diversities in there. See, the darker ones can handle the sunlight better, so they last longer, okay? The lighter ones live up north, okay? So I think the whole idea of evolution that is being taught in our schools is dumb. The purpose of the debate tonight was for Mark to give evidence for evolution. He didn't give any. He said, well, I won't accept fossils. I accept fossils. We have a lot of them. I accept the fact that they prove something died, and they prove that's it. Something lived and died. You couldn't prove it at any kids. And why on earth do you think a fossil can do something no animal today can do? Why would a fossil reptile be able to produce something different? Why don't the reptiles today produce something different than their kind? You guys live in a SpongeBob world of imagination. Well, if we gave it millions and billions of years and generations, it could happen. You can believe that all you want, but that's not science. Science is what we observe, study, test, and demonstrate. It just doesn't happen. You can believe in evolution all you want, but that's all it is, is a belief system. I've said for years, and I'll say it again, it's a religion. And that's why you see all the atheists lately, because they can't come up with evidence for evolution, attack me personally. Ad hominem attacks. Mark's got a bunch of them. He's done. Well, what about this? What about taxes? What about your wife leaving you? What about this? If you want to talk about that, I'm willing to defend myself on any of those. But the purpose of this debate tonight is for you to show evidence for evolution. You didn't. I won. Thank you. Let's go. All right. That concludes Dr. Dino's five to six minute concluding statement. Uh, gentlemen, that was definitely a wild uh, debate. We are close to 400 people in the live chat and it's been one to remember. It's been one to remember. That's for sure. So I appreciate you guys make it for a fun debate, Kent. And, Standing. Yes. Can I just say one thing? I have never, ever done anything about Kent. I don't even have a YouTube channel. I've never spoken about his uh, marriages. I've never spoken about his tax problems. Um, I don't oh, even here, go let, down well, that Mark, road. I, 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 let's just stop because even you just mentioning that stuff seems like kind of like you're just trying to sneak it in there. So let's no, not, you just let's said not that, go that, that I have a channel where I talk about this stuff at hominid attacks. I've never gone after Kent on any of that stuff. All right. Well, I'm, I, I'm glad to say this debate was uh, free from ad hominem attacks. Uh, it got a little passionate at times, but it was fun. It was fun. So let's stop there and move on to some audience questions. We've got a ton of great questions here. And 
Um, what we usually do on this uh, channel is whoever the question is for, we'll make sure they get the last word in order that we can move along uh, smoothly and fairly. Also, I've got a ton of super chats here from uh, logical, plausible, probable. So uh, let me just pull up one of them. Uh, John, I appreciate the uh, support and the super chats. He says after show is guaranteed to be a dumpster fire. Uh, so he's got an after show uh, after this debate as usual. So those after shows are usually a lot of fun. So please check that out. And a lot of uh, super stickers and super chats just kind of showing their love, showing their support, uh, not really any questions attached to them. So guys, thank you so much for that. Okay, let's go right back to the beginning and get to the first question that came in. First one came in from Ken Rock, who uh, Kent is actually scheduled to debate in a few weeks. So Ken Rock, I appreciate the question in the super chat, but this one is actually for Mark. So Mark, um, question from Ken Rock is, what's your opinion on the mud skippers? So nice, easy, simple question. I'm not aware of the mud skippers. Like, is he trying to say, like, I know what a mud skipper is. Is he trying to ask, um, you know, why would it exist? Why do we have an animal that's coming out of the water and uh, doing what it's what it's doing? Um, no, I don't. I don't know what it's doing. I don't know if it's from a I've heard of them. I don't know if it's from a location where it needs to make its way um, over some land to get to other areas of water. Um, this isn't something that I know about, um, but that would explain it. A, a, a fish down, say, in Louisiana, that might be an example. Um, it's not something you'd expect to see in the ocean, though, where it doesn't need to make its way around. But again, there's so much stuff that you need to know about. And biology, as far as individual animals, isn't uh, really something that I study, especially fish. You know, I'm a big cat guy. <laughs> All right, thank Maybe you. Can't know what a mud skipper is and what's special about it. I'm, I'm honestly, I, I can't comment. No worries, I appreciate it, Kent. Um, we'll hand it over to you for your response. Well, mud skippers are very interesting. They do crawl out of the water and crawl across the land, and they're an interesting type of fish. I'd be willing to bet when they have babies, they grow up to be mud skippers. Yeah, of course. Of course. Nothing else. Nothing else. Go ahead. All right. Uh, question was for you, Mark. Do you want a quick final word on that one? Well, of course, we're just going to keep going back to this. I, I guarantee you that a mud skipper has a mud skipper baby. Uh, yes, it will. A absolutely. It will have a mud skipper baby. But you know something? In a thousand years, maybe the mud skipper does have an idea. Maybe it's going to start eating, uh, find out that insects off land is a little bit better of an idea than trying to make a living in the water where there's other things that can eat it. And you will slowly, very slowly, see a mud skipper turn into a mud skipper. Um, will we give it another name? I think Kent gets really caught up in names. Um, just because something has the same name doesn't mean that uh, it, it has to stay that animal. And the second that its name changed um, in our evolutionary chart, um, that it all of a sudden became a brand new animal at the point of name change. We got to give it a name change at a certain point, just like when you, you look at a color wheel, we eventually have to say, okay, it is no longer red. We have moved up the spectrum. We have to call it a new color. Okay, I appreciate the responses from the both of you. Let's move on to the next question. Looks like we got a good mix of questions for Mark and Ken. So next one comes in from Jackson Rowe. Uh, another evolutionist Kent will be debating uh, coming up for this evolution debate series. So Jackson Rowe asks, uh, so I guess it's, it's, it's a question about uh, the ordering of the fossils, essentially, Kent. Jackson Rowe, Kent, why are certain trilobites found only in the upper Ordovician strata and nowhere else? There is no such thing as an Ordovician strata. There's no such thing as a Jurassic strata. There are lots of layers. There is lots of strata to the earth, no question. But there is no such thing as a geologic column. Animals tend to be found in similar layers because they have similar body density, similar habitat. Maybe the trilobites all hang out with trilobites. And so when the flood came, they all got buried together. I bet if there was a flood right now that covered the whole nation of Canada, 40 feet deep in mud, you would probably find not too many people buried with armadillos because probably people don't hang out with armadillos. I don't know Canadians very well, but let's take, pick a different animal. I think most animals tend to be found in the same layers because of their body density, because of their habitat, 
Clams are at the bottom of the so-called geologic column because they already live at the bottom. That's where they are. The flood buried them first. Birds are at the top, generally, because birds are the last things to drown in any flood. They can fly around until they run out of gas and, and, they, and they got hollow feathers and hollow bones. So there's no such thing as an Ordovician strata. The trilobites, and there have been thousands of different kinds of trilobites found. They're an amazing creature. We've got hundreds of fossils of trilobites here in our museum. Come on down and see them in Lenox, Alabama, at Dinosaur Adventureland. And I think they're evidence that something died rapidly. They're proof of a rapid burial. I think all fossils are proof of that. I think even Mark would agree with that. In order to form a fossil at all, it has to be buried pretty quickly or else it's going to decay. Even the bones will decay. Dig up the Civil War cemeteries. I don't, don't, you, don't think you'll find even very many bones in those 150 years ago. Dig up the Viking cemeteries and you don't think you find any bones at all uh, they, they, from 1,000 years ago. Everything decays. So has to be buried quickly, buried under special conditions. So I think the trilobites, Robbie, first of all, I don't know that your question is legitimate. That, that's the only place they're found. Maybe that's the only place they're reported or only place they're allowed to be published on. But there's no such thing as an Ordovician strata. Go ahead. All right. I appreciate that response. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. You're on mute here. And Mark, it's your turn for your response. Go ahead. You know, you know what's funny there, Kent? You almost got it there for just a slight second. You said to me that if I was to die and uh, be buried in uh, 40 feet of water or whatever by mud, there would not be an armadillo um, buried with me. And you are absolutely right. And that is why we know there was no worldwide flood because we would see kangaroos being buried in Asia, which we don't. We only see them down in Australia. As a matter of fact, that's where we find all the marsupials except for a couple that have made it over to America. We have our, our um, opossum here. Um, yes, yes, it, it's exactly what we would expect if we had things buried in certain areas, but to have water flowing around the earth for one year, because you're telling me that there's only one year during the flood that this water sloshed all over the place. Are you really gonna try to tell me with these huge waves that you talk about that carve out valleys and move stuff around and bury sediment down seven kilometers and, and covered in mud that all of the, the marsupials just stayed in Australia? All the panda bears just stayed up in China? Um, what's your point? Of course, if there was a worldwide flood, an armadillo in a year floating on top of the water all bloated would make its way into areas where there's not armadillos. And we don't find just random animals buried out in, ocean, in the ocean. And we don't find recent animals like recent whales buried inland uh, on continents. So where are you getting this? And don't bring up ancient um, uh, fish to make your point, because that's all you'll find on a continent is an ancient fish. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. We'll hand it to Kent uh, for, for your response. If I, if I understand what he just said, we don't find whales fossils on continents. I think that's the only place we find whale fossils. I don't think anybody's digging in the bottom of the ocean to look for whale fossils. Uh, I think all the fossils are found on land or nearly all of them. So the, the existence of fossils at all is evidence of rapid burial. Now, were all the fossils from, from, from Noah's flood? I never said that. I think probably the majority were. I'd put it in the high 90 percentile that the fossils were formed during Noah's flood. But the fact that nobody's found, can I don't know if anybody found kangaroo fossils in China or in Greenland or not. I don't know. It'd be interesting. I've, I've never, I don't care where kangaroo fossils are found. But I think we'd find a variety of fossils that are found in places where they don't live now. I don't think there's any clams living on top of Mount Everest. And I think you would agree, clams are found on top of Mount Everest. So they got moved there somehow. I do believe in plate tectonics. I believe the crust of the earth is flexing and moving and rising, subsiding. I believe in all that stuff. I taught her science 15 years. We can do a debate on that if you'd like. Sure, the, the mountains are rising up. It says so in Psalm 104, at the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, and the water rushed off. I think the mountain ranges all follow the coastlines for a reason. They formed at the same time because of the same thing. Rocky Mountains follow the Pacific Ocean. Here they are over here. The Appalachian Mountains follow the North Atlantic. The Al Andes Mountains follow the South Pacific. I think the geology of the Earth and the geography of the Earth is indication 
there are giant cracks in the crust of the earth. It's floating around. The plates are moving and twisting. We have earthquakes and volcanoes. And the mountain ranges follow the coastlines, just like Psalm 104 would indicate the mountains arose. If I had a chunk of land as big as Texas covered in water and one, one side lifted up, this would become mountains, the water would run off, and this would become ocean. The water from Noah's flood is still here. It's in the oceans. But you guys are willingly ignorant of the creation and that flood. Second Peter chapter 3. That Sorry. was Kent's question. I was supposed to get the closing on that. So all well, I can no, say is, is... Well, Mark, just one second. Actually, what we do is whoever the question was for gets right. the last word. So, for example, you had the last word on the last question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. I hope somebody sees the flaw in that, though. Well, it looks like we got similar questions coming up, so I'm sure you guys will have a chance to uh, <laughs> go back at it. Okay, so this next one comes in from Carmine Cassell the third. Five dollar super chat. I appreciate that question. This time's for you, uh, Mark. So you're going to get the last word on this one. Um, how come all fraudulent evidence? And in brackets, I've got it up on screen for everybody to read. He puts fossil studies, etc., is evidence that supported evolution and not creation. Well, because there is no evidence, there is no evidence for creation. Where have you ever read in a science book evolution for creation? Uh, there, there is none. There, there's no way to prove that Adam was made out of mud. Um, th there's no way to prove that uh, Jesus walked on water or he resurrected after um, three days in a tomb. We have no proof for it because, of, according to Kent, um, humans cannot be trusted because there's hundreds of thousands of us that call ourselves. Um, either scientists or slightly scientifically literate, and we're not to be, be believed, but we're supposed to believe man from 2,000 years ago that stood around a hole in, in a mountain, and all of a sudden what they say is gospel. So all I can say is if man's full of crap right now for, for our own reasons of, um, of furthering our own points, uh, why weren't we full of crap 2,000 years ago when we were making up all these um, magical stories of man walking around doing um, some very weak um, magic acts. I, I, I don't understand why man can be so trusted from 2000 years ago when there's tens of th hundreds of thousands of us now that are lying and just making stuff up. All right. I appreciate the response and the question and we'll hand it over to Kent for your response. I guess I'm not completely understanding what his question is. How come all fraudulent evidence fossils is evidence that supported evolution and not creation? I would say the very existence of fossils at all is evidence of a rapid burial, and that fits perfectly fine into the biblical narrative that there was a worldwide flood. I don't see, and I, can't, I don't think you can find a single fossil that would say, say anything about the Bible being wrong. It doesn't prove that it's right, but it certainly doesn't, you can't prove that it's wrong from the fossils. Any studies that we see, we find a lot of historical records about people talking about a worldwide flood. Maybe that's because there was a worldwide flood. We find a lot of historical records. People talk, at least they used to talk about giants in the earth in those days. Oh, the Bible talks about that. We find people talking about uh, uh, several things in the Bible. We find historical records of, of, of people discussing these kind of things, like the Golden Age. There's a lot of information. Different cultures around the world talked about a time when man used to live to be a thousand. Why would there be records like that? Why would they even talk about that? The Bible says they lived to be 900 before the flood came. So it's, it doesn't prove the Bible's true, but it certainly is an indicator like, hey, maybe there's some evidence here that maybe it is. But I'm not trying to prove the Bible is true. Mark is supposed to prove evidence for evolution. I've seen nothing tonight other than just imagine if we had billions of generations. Keep your SpongeBob at home. That's baloney. I don't believe it. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. And Mark, over to you for the last word. Yeah, the fact that people think that uh, humans could live to 900 years is proof that the Bible is not true. That, that I wouldn't even bring that up. If, if that was part of my argument for um, religion, that's one that I would try to bury along with the flat earth that the Bible believe, um, along with a, a lot of the other things that are in the Bible. I would try to bury that stuff, just like they do the original, um, the Old Testament. They bury that because it's just full of ferocity. So there's one that I would, I would honestly let that go because it's just silly, this whole 900 year thing. That's, that's really silly. Okay. Well, thank you, Kent and Mark. Moving on to the next super chat. I want to make sure we get these uh, super chats in before the two hour mark 
hits. So we've got Kevin's biblical discussions, $20 super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, nice, simple question. He says, Mark, what is your best evidence for evolution? I would say it's endogenous retroviruses. They are absolutely, if you were to start looking into them, um, like I said, I've covered maybe two or 3%. Um, and I will admit my education isn't uh, me pushing this um, this discipline forward. It's me uh, looking into what the professionals say about it. I, I don't claim to, to have any education in this. I'm self-taught. Um, you learn, you read papers, there's tons of papers out there on this stuff. And it's interesting. Um, if you don't like reading, there's tons of videos. And it's no one trying to brainwash anyone. There's no religious tone to it whatsoever. Um, it's just people talking biology. And when you start to look into the to the retroviruses, um, they're very convincing. I don't even think we need more fossils. Um, not to say that we won't continue to look for them but like i said the the endogenous retrovirus it was the nail as soon as they figured that out you know originally uh chromosome two was a really good example how it um it fused um that was a good example but the endogenous retroviruses has just absolutely killed it okay thank you for the response there mark and we'll hand, uh, hand it over to kent for your response go ahead well, if that's the best evidence he has, he has no evidence whatsoever. There seems to be a function for these retroviruses. They certainly, a virus on its own is incredibly complex. And all they do is work with moving the existing DNA code around. Uh, and if it is indeed a semi-living thing, as he referenced several times ago, how did life get started? I mean, a virus is complicated, really complicated, more complicated than the space shuttle unless something more complicated has been built by man since then. Uh, it's not, it's imagination to think that things are related to each other because of retroviruses. That is not going to turn an amoeba to a whale over quadrillions of generations. It's not ever going to happen. It's imagination. Thank you, Kent. And Mark, a quick final word on that one before we move on. It doesn't move DNA around it. It's it can't just, this was brought up to, I don't know who did it. I, I can't, something cat um, brought this up. It was when I stopped watching your, your uh, debates. And I think he was the last one. I don't know if he's creationist cat or something. He brought up this whole um, retrovirus thing and he explained it to you. It, it's not moving around DNA. It's not 1% of our DNA. It's 8%. Um, there, there's many things here and, and it does not move around. We find it in the same locations going back through the same spots. Like I was saying on many other primates, and there's one in a 50 millionth chance in that area of it being there. There's no reason for it to be there. And then the fact that Kent brought up, well, you know, it shows that maybe we need these retroviruses. Yes, we do. We've already talked about it um, to, to the point that we're at now. Some of our um, development as an embryo it requires these retroviruses to move on to the next stage. That is evolution. That is exactly what it is. God would not make a human being and then make it so that we had to get a virus in our system. He had to make us with viruses in our system or it wouldn't have worked. But we can prove those viruses haven't been there since the beginning, Kent. We can prove it. We can take DNA samples and see them being added since we moved out of Africa. Since there's just so much evidence for this that if you understood it, it really would make it hard. For, for anyone to pretend that evolution isn't real. You can still have your religion. You know, you can have God evolving things, but you're well, not- Mark, it looks like away. we have a similar, it, it looks like we have a similar question based on what you're saying here. So maybe I'll get this. This yeah. one came in from Redefine Living. I got it up on screen. And um, from my understanding, Dr. Hoven is saying that the reason why we share these similar endogenous retroviruses is because if they're created units of DNA function, we know most viruses are beneficial for the most part, with a few being bad, then we'd expect them to have function. And yet we find, as, as Dr. Hoven's showing on the screen, we find functional ERV. So Redefine Living's question is, I've got it up on screen here, Mark. He says, question for Mark. 
Um, he says, can you provide an example of an ERV, a non-functional endogenous retrovirus, going from something non-functional to something functional in the embryo, as you talked about, or in regulating genes, determining cell types, things like this? Uh, Mark, go ahead. Well, yeah, we, we know that the endogenous retrovirus that we're talking about that um, moves the embryo forward in its division and turning it into what it becomes, we can see when it was brought in and we can see how it became essential in the way that we evolved. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what it is that they want to know. Well, I think he's um, asking for maybe like um, like a, a technical paper, observable evidence today of a non-functional ERV uh, co-opting or adopting an important function? Like, have we seen that? Do we have a paper for that? Th that is that is such an excellent question that what I recommend he does is go into Google, put his question in there exactly the way he asked it because it was asked very well. And I will bet you that some scientific papers come up and I'll guarantee you next time we have a, a debate, I will look that up to see which exact retroviruses, how far we can date them back to when we first see them being inserted into primates and see how it is that um, this has become um, what it is. And, and again, don't forget, this stuff is very recent. This is all within the last 10 years. That's not to say that our, our minds might not be changed. We change, we, ch we add knowledge continuously. That is what science is. But we don't change the basics of it. Kent loves it when we say that we're never completely sure of things, but we are sure of the basics. We just okay. add to it. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, we'll hand it over to Kent uh, for your response. Anything you wanted to add? Go ahead, take your time. Well, the answer is no. Nobody's ever given an example of a virus, go, not a ret retrovirus, going from non-function to function. Nobody's ever given an example of a virus becoming anything but a virus or bacteria becoming anything but a bacteria or a cow, anything but a cow. There are no bits of scientific evidence what we can observe of these changes taking place that they imagine took place over billions of years. First place, we cannot go back in time. We're stuck in 2022 right now. And fossils are not, well, that's another story. So no, the answer, the answer to the question is no, there are no examples of, of any kind of evolution, which is the whole purpose of this debate. All right, I appreciate that response, Kent. Uh, Mark, if you wanted a quick, quick final response, we are at the two hour mark now, yep. which is the agreed upon uh, time. And we do have just like one or two more super chats we should really get through since they paid money. So uh, go ahead, Mark, real quick response since it's your question. Yep. And then just, we'll move on. just look at look at the dishonesty there. So that gentleman asked a very good question. Um, I believe it was asked in good faith. Um, I said, go online and see if there's any examples. Kent comes on and says, no, there are no examples. Just, just makes a random claim that there's no examples of retrovi endogenous retroviruses that have become um, beneficial. Just automatically rules it right out as no, they haven't turned from one back to the other and, and just puts up a no. It, with authority. I'm saying go look for scientific papers. I can't make that claim. I don't know. I haven't looked it up. Okay, let's really quick just smash through these just really, really quick responses for the super chats. Alec Cox, $25 super chat. I appreciate it. He says, which came first, the nuclei of the cell or the mitochondria? Uh, and then he expands a little bit, but I guess, uh, Mark, how, what are your thoughts on that? What came first? And, and any points you want to make on that? No. Not my, not my specialty. Kent, anything you wanted to add to that one? That's an excellent question. And the answer would be they both had to become together at the same time. Which came first, the tire or the rim? Neither one functions without the other. They have to be, you got to have both or they don't work. So I think the, the all, all through science, all through nature, you can see trillions of examples of things that had to be created simultaneously or they just don't work. So the mitochondria in the cell the, and the DNA and how they split in half, it's an amazing process. I think it had to be designed. For me, it's a no-brainer. Well, if Kent's going to sum it up that easily, then the nucleus. Um, what, what we do know is, or what we figure is that uh, it, the cell was born with a muddy clay-like um, uh, structure around it. So that, that is what I believe I have read about this, but again, you know, it, it, it 
not not my I I can't answer on that. I would just be making stuff up and I'd be no better than Kent if I did that. All right. I appreciate it. A uh, $50 super chat comes in from rock roll. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a great uh, lively chat and we will wrap it up with this last question here uh, because it is uh, relevant to the topic of the debate. I want to thank everybody in the uh, audience. If you sent in a super chat, super sticker and a question, uh, if we were to get to all of these, we would, you know, as usual, we'd be pulling an all nighter. So we got to end it somewhere. This question comes in from trucker trucker. He says, question for Mark. How would you explain fruit fly generations in brackets? He puts who have adapted to new environments, have new generations revert back to their original form when returned to their original environment. I think he's trying to ask. Well, again, I'm not a fruit fly professional, but you have to have pressure. So I understand what he's saying. You move fruit flies around and you will get uh, mutations in fruit, fruit flies. Do we seen them move? back i don't know again you know look it up see if there's a scientific paper out there to see if it it moves back you know kent's always talked about the moths that uh change color because they were near that coal-fired uh um hydro plant you know they change from white to black would as things clean up would they change back to white i don't know um again there's there's millions and millions of examples of evolution and we can't possibly know um, everything that there is to know. But I do know one thing about fruit flies. They're genetically close enough to people that uh, we use them for scientific studies on medical procedures for people um, genetically. So, you know, that, that alone should give you pause to think about, but uh, I know it won't. And again, that you can look up what we use fruit flies for um, as far as uh, um, human studies. Look at it. It's very interesting stuff. Thank you, Mark, for that response. Thank you, Trucker Trucker, for the question. Over to you, Ken, for your response. Um, nobody's ever seen a fruit fly produce a non-fruit fly. They've done all kinds of testing on them. And for the record, it sounded to me like Mark was saying he is saying he is related to a fruit fly because we can uh, use them for scientific medical experiments. Uh, I've covered this on my video number four in great detail. We don't have time now. But the fruit flies are evidence of amazing design. They can fly, for heaven's sake. They're this big. They make their own babies. They got a reproductive system, a digestive system, an integumentary system, an incredibly complex eyeball. Mark wants to think, and wants everybody else to be forced to think, that fruit flies and all complex life forms happen by chance with no designer. He's welcome to believe that, but he should keep that religion at home. Uh, so I think fruit flies are an amazing example of design. When they mutate, they caused, they did all kinds of things to the flies to try to make them mutate. And they got a bunch of mutations, curled wings, no wings, wrinkled up wings. They, what do you call that? Can't fly. It's a crawl now. So they got all kinds of fruit flies that were mutated. No question. Never got a single improvement. And when left alone, they go back to normal fruit flies. Leave them alone. They're doing fine. Thank you, Kent. I appreciate the uh, response to a good question. Mark, quick final word. We got one final super chat that came in that I do got to get to. So Mark, uh, quick final word there. I'll pull this one up and we'll, we'll call it a night. <laughs> the fruit flies. Something that we do put pressure on is dogs. And we see enormous change in dogs. So, And we've seen more than curled up uh, um, ears or curled up toes. We see incredible changes over a short, short amount of times. And yes, we still call them a dog, just like we call a wolf a wolf, just like we call a fox a fox and a coyote a coyote. Just because it has a different name doesn't mean that it's not from the same family and has mutated um, or evolved to the point um, where it is almost no longer longer recognizable and I would say to you take a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and tell me do they have more differences or similarities compared to us and an ape and I would tell you that we're closer to an ape than a chimp than a, uh, a little Chihuahua to a Great Dane. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Kat. So here's the final uh, super chat. Not sure what you guys are going to think of this one, but you know, they 
donated to ask it. So we got to get it up there. So this comes in from crazy L cross $10. He says, if dinosaurs farted themselves to extinction, I think there's a theory out there that this is one of the reasons maybe they went to extinction. How did the T-Rex evolve into modern birds, essentially, if, if it went extinct? Uh, Mark, I think that's more so directed at you. Any thoughts on that? If you want to answer? Yeah, the T-Rex the never became a bird. Um, the T-Rex was dead ended. Um, the smaller little raptors, I know this is one of Kent's very dishonest um, demonstrations where he'll show a bronchiosaurus about to jump off of a cliff. No, no, they, they were raptors. And now we have found raptors with feathers, um, very good impressions, um, beautiful fossils of raptors, small raptors with feathers. So um, no, and they, they didn't fart themselves to death. No T-Rex became um, a bird that did not happen. Again, if you were to go back and look at the evolutionary chain um, that we put together from the fossil record, unfortunately, we don't have the genetics to go back into the, uh, the dinosaur ages, because again, they're so old, which tells us that we're not 6,000 years here um, into, into the, uh, the age of the earth, or we would be able to find some DNA in, um, in dinosaurs, which we have not done. Um, so, and don't bring up Mary Schreitzer. They, they, we know that there's, that's not DNA, but at any rate, yes, uh, they were small raptors and that is what turned into birds and they still are again, just because we call them a bird doesn't mean that there was a complete change at one point where we called a raptor, a bird, and it became a bird. Again, a color chart has many variations, but eventually we have to change the name of the color. Okay, I appreciate the answer to an interesting question for sure. I appreciate the super chat that came in with that question. Uh, Dr. Hoven, over to you. This is the final question. So uh, go ahead. Some final words, final thoughts on that question. The T-Rex never turned into anything. The raptors didn't, didn't change to anything. Raptors produce baby raptors. It, it, it only takes place in the imagination that they became something else. Reptiles today are still having babies that are always reptiles, same kind. Snakes make snakes, dogs make dogs, cows make cows. There are no exceptions to that. And Mark wishes to imagine if we gave it more time, it would happen. That's not science, Mark. Science will be observe, study, test, and demonstrate. You cannot observe it happening. You cannot demonstrate it happening. You cannot produce a lab experiment that will make the amoeba produce a non-amoeba or the cow produce a non-cow. Sure, we get varieties of dogs. Man is producing those by selecting something already existing in the gene code. Tell you what. Give your vet $1,000 if he can put wings on a dog. Now, that would be new information. Turning a wolf into a chihuahua is a loss of information, and it's still a dog kind. It didn't get wings. It didn't get gills. It can't swim underwater. There is no evidence whatsoever for this evolution religion, and it should not be taught in our school system. I rest my case. Come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dino, for that response. And we're just going to do final words and final thoughts. If there is something you wanted to quickly uh, address, Mark, since it is your question, to be fair, go ahead. And then we'll have you also kind of just give some final thoughts and final words. I want to thank you for doing this. We'll allow uh, Kent to give some final thoughts, final words, and then we're going to close her down. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, to think that a wolf turning into a chihuahua is a loss of information is something I cannot understand. Every single bodily um, function is still there. Um, just because it's not as strong does not mean that it's, it's not as adaptable to its environment. If we were to take all of the animals and let them go right now and no longer take care of them, and when I say animals, dogs, um, some of them would go extinct. And I wouldn't be surprised if it would be the bigger dogs, the St. Bernards, the animals that we've changed their mouth shape to the point um, where they're no longer particularly good at um, running really fast. They're just heavy set dogs. So to say a chihuahua has lost information, no, it, it could work its way into a small tree and hide from predators. Um, it may be very successful. It doesn't need as big of a prey to stay alive. Um, that, that would actually be a really good example of evolution would be to take all the dogs, put them on an island, just let them go and see in a hundred years who is still there. I think you'd be surprised. The only problem is, is they are the same species and it would not be a good example because you would still get interbreeding. So it, it would be a tough thing to do, but if there was a way that they did not interbreed and you, they just stayed the way they, they were released, it would be a really good example of what um, natural pressure can do to an animal and who would survive and who wouldn't. 
All right. I appreciate those final words, final thoughts. Uh, Mark, anything you want to say as well, just in, in final words or thoughts just pertaining to, um, you know, the debate and so on and so forth? Yeah, well, it, it started out the same way. And I'll let Kent have the last word because, uh, well, I think I got the first one, so that's fine. Um, at the beginning, uh, Kent did his, his standard spiel. You know, how do we know good from bad? How do we do know right from wrong without religion? Um, chemical this, everything. He brought it all up. And then when I tried to bring it back um, into showing that it's not needed for, for evolution or it's, it's no proof of, of evolution or against it, all of a sudden he just kept saying, oh, well, you know, a dog doesn't turn into a cat or a fish doesn't turn into a cow or amoeba doesn't turn into a, a whale. We get it, Ken. We've told you hundreds of times in hundreds of debates that no, nobody thinks that. Nobody has ever thought that a amoeba turns into a whale. But every single one of us that have sat across from you and talked to you about this has told you. So you never need to ask again. I will speak for the collective group of debaters. Yes, if you believe in evolution, all life forms are connected. Yes, I am related in some way to pond scum. You never, ever have to ask that again. A whale is absolutely related to a pig, which is related to an amoeba. Going back to the very beginning, all life, as far as we can tell, was one beginning. We do not believe that there was tons of different starts where the um, where the ape or, or the, the primate started here and it's all folded out into it. No, every single thing is related. Yes, we are related to a strawberry. Did I come from a strawberry? No, the division between plant and animal was way, way, way back. I came from a primate. So to continue to go back and forth between these, these extremes and, and, and try to make it sound so unreasonable, it's because you want, to, you want to skip the millions and millions of steps in between. You want us to believe that we believe that a cow one day just wakes up and, and shoots out a, 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 what, a chicken? Like, who's ever said that? Nobody. And that, that's Mark. just where it is. And that's the dishonesty. And that's that's just the part that I don't like about it. So, you know, all I can say is thank you for the debate. Um, I would love to talk to you again. I know last time we had a set of three of them. And I think we've left a ton of stuff here on the on the table. I'd be really interested to see if Kent would have the nerve to come back one time. I know I wasn't quite as friendly this time, but I've just been watching this for a year, year after year. And it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. I just hear the exact same juvenile um responses and it's just it's getting old but thank you for having us and uh, i really enjoyed it tonight all right thank you mark for uh, those final words and i guess in a way a second concluding statement <laughs> i appreciate it so we'll, <laughs> hand it over. <laughs> we'll hand it over to uh, dr hoven go ahead uh, kent take your time final thoughts final words and thank you for doing this as well well and thank you mark for coming on again you've many times tonight called me dishonest i resent that and i think you're mistaken about that i'm very honest i want to know the truth nobody's ever seen evolution happen god cannot lie i don't think god's word contains any lies whatsoever god promised if you call upon the name of the lord you'll be saved i'd like to see you get saved mark give your heart to the lord i think god made the world i think he owns it i think he makes the rules and i think we're all guilty of breaking his rules if evolution is true there are no commandments. There are no rules. Thou shalt not kill. That's not a rule. If evolution is true, how do you how, what, define what, what is dishonest? If evolution is true, is it dishonest for the cheater to sneak up on the prey? No, perfectly fine. But I believe we've all broken God's rules and we're going to be judged. You're going to be punished if you broke his rules and you better find a substitute. And Jesus Christ wants to substitute for your sins. He did for mine 53 years ago. Simple question for Mark and all you viewers. If you died today, where would you go? You're going to die. You going smoking or non-smoking? You might want to decide because you're going to be dead for a really, really, really long time. You might get a longer dash between two dates than somebody else, but we've all got a dash between two dates. Where are you going? If you're a Christian, let me ask you a question. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Can't you find something to do? <laughs> you can get out there and start commenting on these atheist channels and ask them, where's the evidence? And they will say, oh, 
fossils, dead stuff we found in the ground. That's not evidence. You found something dead in the ground, and you don't know it had any, any kids. Some of you ought to get out there and start. I, people ask me all the time, I got a call today. How do I start a ministry? I said, do you go to public school? They said, well, yeah, I did. I said, did they ever have a fight in the hallway? Yeah. What's the first thing that happens when somebody hollers, fight, fight? Everybody comes to watch. You want to start a ministry? Start a fight against evolution. You'll get a lot of attention in a hurry. You see, you see all the anti hoven websites we got up there now and YouTube channels. I love it. Thank you so much for having me on. And we've got, what, five, six more debates lined up. Uh, uh, Donnie, I'll take them all on. Mark, you got some evidence for evolution? I'll take all the Canadians on at one time, Skype interview, whatever, <laughs> however they do it. Where's the evidence for evolution? Where is it? You haven't shown any tonight. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. We can title it Kent versus Canada. <laughs> hey, I'll take them on. You got it. Okay, gentlemen, uh, that was definitely a fun, entertaining, engaging debate. We've had almost 400 people the entire time and almost two and a half hours. So you guys deserve uh, some sleep and some rest and a vacation. Uh, I'll be back uh, after I let these guys out because I'm going to just go over some uh, announcements for everybody as in, in terms of Kent's upcoming debate. So Kent, God bless. Uh, Mark, thanks for doing this. And Dane of Truth is out. All right. It's just me, guys, just for a couple minutes here. That was definitely a wild one. That was one to remember. Uh, worlds collide and um, the real Super Bowl. So that was, I think, out of all the uh, evolution debates that we've had for this new series, which I think we've had almost, I think almost about a dozen so far. I'm not sure. We've been doing them at least once a week. Uh, this one was definitely uh, one of the best ones. And just in, I think, three days, uh, we've got the next um, contestant, I guess you could say, the next uh, interlocutor, uh, uh, Mikey from the Call Me Emo ch uh, channel. He'll be debating, Kent, is there reasonable evidence for evolution? Uh, we've had another busy week, guys. Last night, we had the epic debate between CJ Cox and Dr. Leighton Flowers. So if you have not checked out that one, please do. We've had two, two, two nights, two main events. Uh, we've also got, uh, this one's going to be huge, uh, Tom Jump and uh, Kent Hoven. They'll be debating the uh, same topic. Is evolution a reasonable scientific theory? I'll be back in the ring uh, debating Luca Medugno. Is there evidence for human evolution? Uh, one of my favorite topics. That'll be on the third. March 3rd. So make sure you are here for that one. We've got a solid mix of theology and soteriology related deba debates as well. Kelly Powers will be back. He'll be debating Rodney Smith. Is oneness biblical? We also have on the 28th, uh, not this one, uh, it'll be uh, Jackson Rowe and T-Rock. They'll be debating the fossil record. That is the 28th. So just in a couple of days. And then we've also got uh, the great transitional fossils debate between Christopher Silvius and Jackson Rowe. We've got that one coming up as well. Last week we had, this one was epic. This one's getting a lot of great feedback. Wade the Wizard and Dr. Dino. So if you're new to the channel and you have not yet seen that debate, please do check it out. First week of March, we've also got Professor David McQueen from Standing for Truth Ministries, our team geologist. He's going to be debating Taylor Gray from the Snake Was Right YouTube channel. You're not going to want to miss that one. And then in April, Professor McQueen is also going to be busy because he's got another debate, the Genesis flood debate. He'll be debating Jason Torn. So that'll be a sophisticated, a very intellectual debate on uh, geology, flood geology, uniformitarianism, and uh, so on and so forth. That is going to be epic. We also just, I love this thumbnail here. I appreciate uh, Brian Emery's humor. Uh, Kent and Brian Emery, 
uh, at the end of March, they'll be debating is evolution a reasonable scientific theory. So guys, if you're not yet subscribed, but you love debates, interviews, discussions, and more, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and also check the upcoming live stream section because this was just a snapshot of the overall uh, debates, interviews, and shows that we have for you guys in the next couple months. So we're busy. We're busy. We're working full time for you. Cunning media in the house. He says, can't wait to watch SFT next debate. Yeah, we've got a ton for you. Uh, plenty more uh, Super Bowls to come. <laughs> Logical, plausible, probable. His after shows are always a ton of fun. So that is going to kick off right after this. John, I'm tired. This was, you know, almost a two and a half hour debate. It was a wild one. And I'm just going to have a bite to eat, uh, refuel on coffee, John, as you know, brother. And then I will be joining as well. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get in some endogenous retrovirus related uh, debate and discussion. So, guys, if you're not yet subscribed, again, please subscribe. We're almost at 8,000 subscribers. And our secondary channel titled Young Earth Creation, make sure to sub subscribe there as well. We're almost at 20,000 subscribers. So uh, we re-upload a lot of our creation evolution related material to that specific channel. And so, um, yeah, make sure you're subscribed there as well. And if you want to support us, help us uh, keep putting out full-time content, putting on and hosting these great debates, getting uh, the biggest names in the Young Earth Creation world on the channel for presentations, lectures, and discussions. You can find us on Patreon. We are, uh, we are trying to hit 100 patrons for 2022. So if you want to help us hit 100 patrons, uh, check us out on Patreon as well. All the relevant links, including the Standing for Truth official website, standingfortruthministries.com is in the description box. And that being said, that's all that comes to mind. I'm going to take a quick break and then we are going to head over to John's channel for the epic after show for this heroic, this monumental debate between Mark Drysdale and Dr. Ken Hoven. It definitely did not disappoint. We had almost 400 people in the chat. And uh, yeah, please pass around and share around this content because the truth is important and also critical thinking is important as well. God bless all. Standing for Truth is really out this time. God bless. <music>